Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online. Uh, this is uh, today uh, is one of the rare occasions we are going to conduct a full a total hip, primary total hip replacement basic course on a virtual platform like Ortho TV. So over to today's convener, Dr. Abdul Ghani, to introduce you to the course and the faculty. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. I today welcome all the esteemed guest faculty to speak on this webinar, IDIA basic instructional course on primary total hip replacement. Uh, my idea was to have the target audience as in mainly the resident and the low volume surgeon. And also to idea was to have the full practical theoretical knowledge background with of course the practical tips and tips and the videos as well. So that it becomes a complete uh, minimal knowledge which all of us need to know and especially just to revisit and refresh ourselves and tweak our daily practice and learn from each other. Obviously, it's a great platform to be interacting together in this uh, gloomy period of uh, coronavirus. It is my pleasure to welcome our esteemed guest faculty and to introduce the uh, we have star started faculty with a lot of experience in orthoplasty. Unfortunately, to start with, we are going to miss Dr. Avtar Singh, whom we all know, leading orthopedic surgeon of the Punjab and giant replacement surgeon. Unfortunately, he could not make it at the very last minute because of unavoidable circumstances. I introduce our next speaker, who is a board to join, Dr. C.S. Yadav. He is former professor at Alin Institute of Medical Sciences, and now he is a chairman and head department of giant replacement at Sir Ganga Ram. Hospital, New Delhi. He is very known figure there. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you to Dr. Manoj Vadwa. We all know him, a leading orthopedic surgeon and giant replacement surgeon of Northern India. He is chairman and executive director of Elite Orthopedic Private Limited Hospital. Presently, he is working at Paris Hospital Panchkula and IV Hospital Mohali. It is my uh, pleasure to welcome from overseas, Dr. Rohit Rambani. He is uh, one of our own, but presently working as a consultant trauma and orthopedic uh, uh, giant replacement surgeon at United Lincolnshire Hospital NHS Trust. And he's also visiting professor at AMS Rishikesh. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the master of the webinars and the president of Gujarat Orthopedic Association, Dr. Naveen Chakar. Uh, you. Welcome you, sir. Uh, my friend, Dr. Ch Chandra Shekhar Chikamani, uh, he is a senior giant replacement surgeon at People Tree Hospital, and he is a director and CEO and founder of the People Tree Hospital. And he, now he has created a group of hospital for last, just uh, started working 10 years back only, and he has made a huge name there. Uh, we are going to be joining, joined by Dr. Rajesh Gupta, bit late. He's professor and head of department of orthopedic at Eskam Hospital, Jammu. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, and introduce to you my friend, Dr. Sanjeev Gupta. He's professor and head of department of orthopedic GM Jammu and a very dear colleague of mine. Uh, it is again a wonderful pleasure to introduce to you my younger colleague, Dr. Mohammed Haseeb Ghani, now presently working as an orthopedic Registrar and Fellow in Pelvic Estabulum Surgery at Royal London Hospital, UK. Last but not least, Dr. Kanav Pada. He is Postdoctor Fellowship, Giant Replacement Surgeon, and presently working as a consultant in Gandhi Nagar Hospital, Jammu. Simultaneously, it is my pleasure to welcome all the audience uh, here because without their participation and active uh, uh, presence, obviously, this program is not worthwhile. So, thankful to them for their registration to this meeting and attending this. Of course, we must acknowledge uh, the, our contribution by Sun Pharma for logistic support and Dr. Neeraj Bijlani and his team of orthopedic for all logistic support. Uh, with these words, uh, welcome you again and over to my co-moderator, Dr. Rohit Rambani and Dr. Sanjeev Gupta for the future, for the proceeding, please. Thank you. We can start. Dr. Sanjeev, you want to introduce the first person? Uh, 
Dr. Sanjeev, you unmute yourself, please. Uh, sorry, uh, the first speaker of the day is Dr. Kanupada, who will be speaking on biomechanics and templating. So I request Dr. Kanup to start with his talk straight away, please. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. 10 minutes talk. Yeah, sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Gani for this opportunity. So uh, good evening, everybody. My talk would be a basic topic on... Uh, the biomechanics and uh, templating regarding a total hip replacement. So I'll start sharing my screen now, sir. Sir, I hope uh, uh, the screen is coming. No, it's not. Yeah, it has started coming. So go full screen. Yes. Uh, so, uh, biomechanics and templating in a total hip replacement. Uh, so, uh, so, the biomechanics of the principle, as we all know, that hip is a uh, ball and socket joint. Uh, so, there are ty uh, various types of forces that are acting on the hip joint. Uh, uh, especially, this diagram is about a single stance phase if you stand on one leg. So the body weight is uh, going through the center of the symphysis pubis, and uh, another uh, the abductor uh, the abductor mechanism is also putting an equivalent force on the hip joint. So to maintain the stability, the hip joint is producing a force in the opposite direction to all these forces. So this is a resultant force, and probably this is known as a joint reactive forces, as we can see. So in this diagram, we can see uh, there are two types of lever arms. One lever arm is from the center of the head to the center of the body. So this is known as B. It is a longer uh, lever arm. And then another li lever arm is from the abductor mechanism to the center of the uh, femoral head. So it is a shorter lever arm. So, uh, the, uh, so by understanding this diagram, we can make out that abductors have to produce more tension in, in, a, in order to keep the hip balanced and the pelvic in the same plane. And also to prevent that uh, opposite side of the pelvis uh, dipping. So... So as we all suggested, there are three types of acting on the hip joint, body weight, abductors, and in the opposite direction is the joint reactive forces. So these joint reactive forces play an important role while doing a hip arthroplasty as uh, increase or decrease in these forces can uh, lead to an early wear or uh, loosening, etc. So that will see. Uh, so again, it is joint reactive forces is the sum up of body weight as well as abductor force. So uh, here is a few example of a hip biomechanics that occur in a coxa vera as well as velga. So first diagram we can see here, it is a normal hip joint. So the joint reaction forces, uh, the R is there. So we can see that it is, uh, suppose it is in a 200, the force is 200 newtons. So in a coxa vera situation where that abductor lever arm is increased, so the resultant hip forces, joint forces are decreased. So here uh, the chances of uh, wear and tear are uh, decreased. So it is 152. But similarly, as contrast to a coxa uh, vera situation and a co coxa valga situation, where the abductor lever arm is severely decreased, the joint reaction force is increased. So there is an increased load on the hip. Uh, in a native hip, it, it can lead to early arthritis. And in a, uh, in, in a patient with a hip, arth hip, hip uh, transplant patient, it can... Uh, Internet connection issue. Lost your voice, uh, Anna. No, he has to. Anna, what, what stop happened? His, stop his video, then automatically it will go. That bandwidth will be used in the voice. Dr. Naveen Takar, I'll make you a co host also. You can control that. Screen is visible, <laughs> sir. You can. Uh, it is visible, but uh, Kanau, please, uh, can you mute or uh, you stop your video so that that bandwidth can be used in the audio? You will not be seen, but uh, your bandwidth can be used. Yeah. Dr. Naveen Thakkar, I have done it. Okay, you can go ahead. Chalo. Yes, now you can go ahead. Uh, sir, I hope this diagram is cleared. I have told this about this yeah. diagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is very clear. Uh, so, same principle here, the channelage principle. So, what channelage do to, uh, uh, used to do in arthroplasty, he used to decrease, he used to increase that abductor lever arm. 
by uh, lateralizing the trochanter and making it more distal so that there was less forces on the hip joint surfaces as well as he used to medialize that uh, acetabular component so that the lever arm from the center of the body to the hip joint was uh, decreased so resultant uh, with these results he used to increase the longevity of his implants and uh, still now if we take any standard uh, the charles hip has the highest survival rate maybe 30 35 years and he used to uh, do that 22.5 uh, that head component but it is still the gold standard for any arthroplasty but uh, now these techniques are not be used with the, by because there are so many improved type of implants so trochanter osteotomy as well as medialization of the head is not used now well, more medialization is not done now so uh, uh, then th this this was the basic uh, templating now i will shift to uh, some of the templating uh, techniques so is it necessary everybody knows yes so uh, the question is why it is necessary so uh, it is necessary uh, it is necessary to avoid that mal position of the head we can see in these diagrams uh, the, the component are all mal position so uh, in this we can see the acetabular component is uh, a little let, bit lateralized and of a big size to avoid that improper sizing and to improve, uh, and to prevent that post op uh, complication to avoid that lip length discrepancy so uh, according to the great morris miller uh, he told that for uh, it the templating forces surgeon to think in three dimensions greatly improve the precision of the surgery shortens the length of procedure and greatly reduces the incidence of complication so what is a templating a templating is nothing but a process of anticipating the size and position of the implant prior to the doing that external surgery so uh, it provides it restores the biomechanics determines the chance of implants and identify the osseous deformity and appropriate uh, component placement and it becomes a rehearsal for the reconstruction to be performed so first thing is to we have to assess the quality and magnification of the radiograph so we can see here the 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 Uh, the radiograph is not proper because the center line is not there obturator foramen are not open up the, the, the limbs are in external rotation so this is a proper radiograph to be taken in which <clears throat> the center of the coccyx is corresponding to the center of the pubic symphysis uh, the obturator foramen are open like a cat eyes and uh, the the hip is in adequate uh, rotation maybe like 15 degrees of internal rotation so to assess the magnification we can uh, use a ball or any other ball to see uh, and then post up and then to calculate how much magnification it is there in that x ray uh, so then we have to identify that anatomical landmarks so on the femoral side we can identify and the and the acetabular side in, we can identify firstly femoral side we we used to see what is the type of canal whether it is a dor a dor b dor c of uh, type of canal then is the position of the greater trochanter then is the neck length and curvature then is the position of the lesser trochanter then we can shift to the acetabulum side and see the roof of the acetabulum the weight bearing dome and then we can see the tear drop so here uh, we can see uh, what is the proper axis to be taken in 15 degree of internal rotation so then we identify the mechanical references where hip rotation offset of the femoral as well as acetabular component lip length and lip, uh, hip length so hip rotation of center if we take um, two circles from the acetabulum and the center of the femoral head we can easily get a hip center of rotation another method is drawing a ranava triangle so in a ranava triangle i will not go into detail but we calculate the height of the pelvis divide the pelvis by 1/5 because the acetabular uh, component is because the acetabulum is 1/5 of the size so we make a line along this tear drop and uh, calculate this and take the center of this and uh, we can calculate the hip center though it is not an accurate method but our navet and all are using this uh, regularly uh, so this is an offset we can calculate what is the femoral medial offset as well as this offset so it is it can help us in using that lip length discrepancy and all acetabular offset femoral offset so we can easily calculate the lip length as well as the hip length we can take a fixed point on the pelvis and we can take a fixed point on the femur maybe a lesser trochanter on the femur and a tear drop on the pelvis so we can calculate whether there is a shortening lengthening or which we we need uh, which side we need to increase or decrease to get that proper hip length as well as stability so identify the area of deformity we can identify the area of deformity whether it is the acetabular side deformity like in dysplasia excessive bulge and previous fracture previous osteotomy or it is a problem on the femoral side like coxa vara velga trochanteric overhang excessive bulge and previous fracture osteotomy etc so uh, now is the no comes the templating part the real part so the manufacturer pro provides us with the various template 
so we need to keep the template and calculate the exact size of the of the this is shown in the asset table itself so the center of this point has to be kept on the center of the asset table this femoral side the femoral cup should not cross that ilio ischial line or what we call as poker's line and this i should be placed on the superior lateral part of the asset table so if any implant fits in that area we can make uh, we can get an idea that this type of cup we will be able to read that we should not uh, go beyond the ischial line and the cup should not be too lateral so uh, estable uh, templating helps us in uh, finding out the center of rotation and component size and position so here is an example the three important landmarks are tear drop the ischial line as well as the superior lateral part of the asset table so this one and this is the cup though it is a in this diagram it is a little lateral but it should not cross that ischial line so acetabular templating we have shown this acetabular templating and we can calculate the exact size we have made a blue marker along that ischial line so our component should not cross that line uh here are few examples in which there is an inadequate we can see in figure b and c there is an inadequate cup placement uh, the cup is too lateral uh, and sometimes there is a medial osteophyte we need to read that to get that proper uh, cup placement inside that socket to get a good hold of the bone so abduction angle we all know that that we have to put near between 40 to 45 more the horizontal better it is because the vertical cup is associated with loosening and early wear as we all know for hard and hard bearing we should aim less maybe at 40 degrees rather than 45 uh, so protruso acetabuli we should not uh, rim too much uh, medially and maybe use a bone graft or a, to fill that defect or use some kgs etc so for femur comes we need to see the hip offset choice of implant stem size and neck length etc and neck cut we have to do so it is very important so why it is important it is important to store the femoral offset it, it, it determines the limb length discrepancy and the key factor in pre operative planning is the femoral offset so here we can see the center of rotation of the acetabulum as the femur does not correspond so we can get an idea how much neck length or how much we have to bring the femur uh, down to get that uh, now only one uh, minute please uh, yes sir. time is up yeah thank you so uh, one minute sir yeah. so uh, this is an important diagram we have to what we can do in a coxa valga situation we have to put a small acetabular component take a high femoral cut, uh, neck cut and start with the short neck then stem with the low offset so in a coxa valga situation uh, So this is an example. We can either choose a high hip center or uh, in a coxa valga situation, we can put a large uh, acetabular component. Uh, we have to do a low, low femoral neck cut. Head, head, we can also use a head with a long neck and stem with a high offset. Uh, so these are the examples. But we have to. So another we can see a, uh, see a type of canal according to door. There are three types of canal. So in type C we can use a cemented component. In a type A we can a type A or B we can use an uncemented component as well. So stem size we can calculate, etc. And limb length discrepancy along with that we can also calculate in this during templating. So uh, I conclude my talk in saying that an accurate and careful preoperative planning can result in a balanced hip reconstruction by correcting the leg length differences and restoring the offset. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Kanav. It was an excellent, uh, excellent presentation on biomechanics and templating. Uh, now we move to the next talk. by thank you sir thank you dr ghani his talk is on who is an ideal candidate for thr over to dr ghani please dr ghani dr ghani is not seen can you see my screen yes yes, yes we can see yeah. very well thank you so i wanted to disappear actually but nahi okay so good afternoon my topic is who is an ideal candidate for thr uh before we jumping on to do the thr actually we no need to know when to jump on to do the surgery and where what are the indication exact indication so somehow there is a problem just click it. click on the slide yeah. Yeah. automatically it will go yeah. No so, need to go on the arrow. Yeah. Right. So why this topic actually? Why I am dis discussing this topic? THR always is not a beneficial issue. There can be a risk. But what we have to do is we have to benefit. Uh, we have to balance the ratio. The benefit should outweigh the risk. Then only we should proceed. If the risks are more, risks are more. 
then obviously we need to be careful perhaps not to go ahead by this time we all know that what are the benefits essentially it reduces the pain increases the mobility of the joint and increases the movement of the patient it does correct the deformity it equalizes the limb length however not always it increases the leg strength helps in returning the patient to the normal activities and obviously enables better quality of life but having said that all is not that all good it can have anesthetic risk intraoperative difficulty and complication it can lead to injury to the neurovascular uh, structure dislocation is an issue infection obviously is a disaster it can have a limb length discrepancy dvt and other complication of recumbency limited life of prosthesis we all know and obviously cost is a big factor everywhere and especially in developing world and we all know the limitation of artificial joint a person cannot be carrying on the same activities as of a native joint and of course when unfortunately revision required the surgery is associated with more complication and it, uh, it is more complex procedure so when to offer in knowing these benefit and risk when to offer a thr to a patient the primary indication we all know is end stage arthritis any form that is rheumatoid arthritis osteoarthritis primary or secondary but is end stage arthritis and especially when non operative treatment including weight reduction activity modification ambulatory aids physical therapy medication like paracetamol and nsaids have failed to relieve the pain and disability and patient is actually not responding then only we should be advising surgery not without trying conservative measures in younger patient we must consider surgical alternative especially in non inflammatory arthritis to preserve the joint as long as possible especially in younger patient like arthrodesis do rarely done these days other procedures like acetabular augmentation or femoral osteotomy aim is to improve the biomechanics as dr kanav already told and of course to relieve the patient symptom but simultaneously the procedure the this surgery should be yeah, we will be should be able to convert easily later on to thr if required so most common criteria for thr are consist of pain functional limitation stiffness and radiological radiological changes unfortunately there is no objectively specific cut of value for this but these are the grossly the criteria you are dealing with when we talk of pain obviously that you have to ascertain for sure that this pain is coming from hip not originating from si joint or lumbar spine or any other area so the pain has to be coming from arthritic part of the hip joint then only the indication is correct and patient is going to be benefited otherwise patient is not going to be benefited when it is coming to the pain you must assess the severity whether there is a rest, rest pain or night pain which is obviously more significant and what is the effect of activity so far as the pain is concerned and what is the need of analgesic if patient is needing analgesic 24/7 that means it is an indication and what are the functional limitation the it it is more severe in patient with inflammatory arthritis than non inflammatory arthritis when we talk of functional limitation what is the walking distance need of patient for of crutches or cane for carrying normal mobility any difficulty in climbing stairs any difficulty in putting shoes or socks and more of uh, more so what is the effect of these limitation on daily activities and what is effect on the quality of life if it is significant effect on the daily activities and the quality of life is getting difficult or miserable then obviously you must offer thr but if there is no significant effect perhaps you must refrain and try to delay it as much as possible when you call talk of stiffness stiffness without pain is also an indication for surgery the example like enclosing spondylitis or previous hip joint fusion either spontaneous usually from any infection or surgical arthrodesis and also the arthrodesis should be taken down before replacing any other joint ankylosis can be a tremendous functional disability in absence of pain and patient can be bed bound and this, this disability can be not only just because of the hip stiffness but can also lead to back pain pain in the knees and pain in the opposite hip and that can be very disabling thr in such group can have a dramatic outcome positive function the next criteria is radiographic changes the severity of radiographic changes of arthritis usually but not always reflect the severity of the patient disability so decision is based on the patient symptom not only just the severity and at times in even an osteoarthritic knee when there is a inflammatory response the symptoms can be severe at times there is a very confusing especially in presence of mild changes 
whether the pain is actually coming from the joint or not, then you can inject local anesthetic. And if pain is responding, then definitely that is, hence uh, that can be uh, the pain because of the hip and hence the mild radiographic signs is not an absolute contraindication to joint replacement. So when not to operate, it is easy when to operate to decide, but more important is when not to operate. Especially one has to be careful if there's local persistent, particularly pyogenic infection. If there is severe disease of nerve or blood vessel that could endanger limbs, or there is a severe periartical bone stock deficiency, which is not able to hold uh, the implant, then obviously you, uh, you should not be going ahead. And poor muscle condition, especially the abductors, that is very important that uh, you must carefully assess that. Relative contraindication, significant medical disease, psychiatric disease, dementia, systemic illness, local bone tumor, cyst pregnancy, patient undergoing extensive dental or urological procedure uh, should undergo this procedure prior to THR. Any overweight patient like more than 100 kg or BMI more than 40, small skeleton, osteoporosis, osteomalacia, bone deformity, significant, impaired immunity, poor nutrition, drug abuse, smoking, alcohol abuse. These are the relative contraindications. One has to be careful in renal dysfunction, especially when you're using metal and metal processes. And if patient is allergic to a particular implant, one has to be taken that into consideration as well. So what are the risk factors? Increasing complications, skin ulceration, necrosis, rheumatoid arthritis, previous hip surgery, recurrent UTI, patient steroid treatment, CRF, diabetes, malignancy requiring chemotherapy, or tooth extraction. There are few issues that are controversial and debatable issues, like what is the age, ideal age? Previously, you used to be thought of that 60 to 80 is the ideal age. However, of late, there is a shift to the extreme age also, like as early as in teens or early 20s can also one can go under uh, uh, THR if the symptoms are there and genuine indication is there. And similarly, there is no upper chronological age beyond which the THR cannot be offered to the patient. If you quote the studies, the THR in cognitive intact and active patient might be a credible and safe option and with similar surgery related complication as compared to the younger patient than 83 years. But there is another study which quote says that more likely the admission to ICU more likely these patients are going to be discharged to the rehab center rather than discharging back home and longer hospital stay. Tuberculosis and THR, another controversial issue and controversies are mainly the timing of surgery after the THR and is there any chance of reactivation of disease, the long-term survival and ATT, pre-op and post-op, how long we should be using. There is a systemic review of a published study between 2000 and 2017 and they gave two weeks pre-op and post-op six to 18 months ATT. And they concluded that the THR is a safe option provided that your diagnosis has to be accurate. It has to be efficient pre and post separate to ATT and thorough debrima. And if there is a sinuses, it should be two stage procedure rather than one stage. And people have gone even ahead that this is a study in active tuberculosis. And they say that THR in patient with active tuberculosis is also safe. And there is no need of to delay the surgery until the quiescent stage of happen. So obviously you have to judge it carefully in your own concern. THR in sickly of septic arthritis and another controversial topic. Two stages is a viable option, but not a single stage. And the risk of recurrence of infection is as high as 36%. Safe time interval post quiescent infection is not known yet. There is a study from Brightington Hospital, the largest series. Uh, it has defined the recent septic arthritis as less than 10 and older septic arthritis as more than 10 years. And more than 10 years, older septic arthritis has got lesser complication compared to recent septic arthritis. Obesity and THR is another controversial topic. Though obesity and particularly morbid obesity is considered to be a relative contraindication to the THR, but there are series of studies reporting low complication rate with significant improvement in functional level as without much increase uh, in implant loosening. However, the other studies are, uh, are saying that these patients are relatively younger, they require longer operative time, they've got higher rate of perioperative complication, but the current literature is mixed. Whether to go for simultaneously staged or staggered bilateral THR, although it is a one, done, one and done anesthesia and recovery procedure, one can get excellent result. However, the concern in patients with significant comorbidity is that they are at high risk of post-operative complication, and hence the patient selection is critical for better outcome. When we talk of uh, literature, there's a heterogeneous and quality of evidence is low. However, it does support to perform bilateral THS simultaneously in younger patient than 65 years old and with ASA 1 and 2. And it has suggested to avoid stage surgery with the same hospitalization. 
is there any literature evidence about the correct indication actually unfortunately not much but there, uh, uh, as per this study one of the first multi centric multinational european survey and they have shown concluded that no universally accepted criteria which, by which we determine the severity of osteoarthritis and appropriate indication of thr another study has shown that 13.6% indication were considered to be inappropriate and in 46 patient the procedure was considered to be uncertain indication in conclusion thr offers a highly predictable treatment option however key to success is proper patient selection you have to balance the, the risk versus benefit ratio obviously the benefit has to be more than risk joint replacement is a joint decision not a unilateral from surgeon side it is between the patient and surgeon finally just knowing how to do thr is not an indication for surgery don't treat the x-ray but treat your patient it should be patient's need rather than surgeon need for performing surgery thank you very much thank you dr gani for an excellent talk now we go to the next topic which is pre operative planning in thr uh, by dr mohammad hasib gani over to you dr hasib you're on mute uh, sip powerpoint was okay you are unmute that's why just make your mic on sir unmute yourself dr sip can you hear us powerpoint was okay fantastic hello your cordless your cordless is i think it is not working it has lost hello please unmute i have asked you to unmute yeah 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 sorry i i just couldn't find the right control i'm sorry about that no no uh, no issue Uh, good evening everyone thank you dr gani for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak in the midst of uh, such a stellar faculty i don't i don't uh, think i even belong here uh, but my name is hasim uh, most of you don't know me i i trained in orthopedics and gmc jammu under dr gani and currently i work in the royal london hospital as a uh, pelvic surgery fellow uh, i've been given this topic uh, of uh, prepare uh, planning for a primary total hip um, i think tradi uh, traditionally it has been associated it has been uh, um, you know it has been uh, taken to mean templating and uh, deciding what implants uh, the, uh, to use but there is so much more to planning for a total hip operation like for any other operation um, and uh, i'll try to touch upon uh, non x ray and non implant things uh, as quickly as i can in this 10 uh, in these 9 minutes that i have the meaning so i i'm going to uh, i think uh, it's all about anticipating difficulties in the operation and um, uh these 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 involve assessing the patient clinically getting the right imaging then optimizing the patient uh for this procedure and discussing the with the patient the procedure that you intend to do and what it entails and what they should expect from it history and physical examination are core and we are uh, assuming that we have established that the source of pain is the hip joint in in question um and that uh, uh and uh, because otherwise the patient is not going to be a happy patient uh the etiology uh, usually primary oa but other etiologies for um, uh, uh for total hip um, replacement uh, they lend to uh, they uh, they lend other, some difficulties like for example inflammatory arthritis may be associated with you know plantar axial instability which may be taken to which may need to be taken care of with uh, necessary imaging and uh, uh, precautions in the operating room other joint involvements patients may be on medications which may need to be uh, adjusted uh, protrusio or ankylosis may need uh, surgical uh, necessary surgical addressal uh, patients may have soft bone which may you know uh, necessitate uh, cemented components patients with dysplasia may need smaller components or custom implants uh, trauma arthroplasty in the, in the in the context of uh, acute intercapsular neck of femur fractures 
you know, we may, may need to uh, think on the in terms of higher dislocation risks and modify our approach. You know, uh, ream the acetabulum carefully because it's not as hard as in a as in a primary osteoarthritic hip. Patients' comorbidities, obesity, as Dr. Gani mentioned, this, I think my talk has been very well primed by the previous two ones. Um, high anesthetic risks, positioning the patient, how to obtain access. We may need a large incision. We may even need an extra assistant uh, to hold the leg. Uh, and of course, there are high, 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 there's a high risk of complications. Diabetes needs to be addressed. Neuromuscular disorders for patients with, uh, with weak muscles, they have a higher incidence of instability and dislocation. Patients who are uh, alcohol dependent or use drugs, they are a bit unreliable and they have a high risk of dislocation. Patients with anemia, we need to, we need to optimize these patients history of past surgery in the hip or in the back uh, because uh, it, there's a, the back has an intimate relation with the hip and uh, mobility of the back has a direct bearing on how you are going to implant your hip, uh, your cup, basically. Uh, previous untoward events in, uh, in, in previous surgeries like um, um, a, re uh, an, a reaction to a drug or uh, anesthetic complications. Allergies to antibiotics, this, is, this may need to be taken into account. Latex allergies, Small things, but these may make a, a huge difference. Then when you examine, in, uh, in addition to a general physical examination, uh, uh, examining the hip for, for, for the quality of skin, previous scars from surgery, infection in somewhere in the leg, which may, which may, you know, which may, which, which may be the nidus and uh, lead to infection in the hip later on and should be addressed beforehand. You assess range of motion, flexion deformities, shortening, uh, Examine the spine because, uh, like we said, uh, spinal deformities have a bearing on how you implant your hip components. Uh, previous fusions, previous fusion surgery in the lumbar spine, it, it, it is known to be associated with a higher dislocation risk. So we need to make necessary adjustments, both in terms of approach and the uh, and the relative uh, angles in which we implant our components. Uh, and so, so it's also the case with fixed obliquity of the pelvis. Is a line diagram uh, demonstrating how uh, uh, the pelvic tilt. Uh, causes a relative uh, change in the um, acetabular antivirgin. There's a protective covering by the pelvis uh, when we move from uh, standing to sitting position. And if the lumbar spine is not mobile enough, uh, this does not happen and you risk dislocation. Uh, getting the right imaging, like uh, Dr. Pada uh, uh, has explained so well, we need the right x-rays to plan the surgery correctly. We need, we may need additional X-rays like of the lumbar spine or the cervical spine uh, uh, to, uh, to assess any, any other necessary uh, uh, pathologies. A CT scan may be necessary in, uh, in patients with uh, uh, previous fractures of the acetabulum or the proximal femur or dysplasia or protrusia to assess the bone stock. Uh, uh, and of course, then templating on the basis of these images paramount. We already gone through how to obtain a, a best profile of the neck by internally rotating for an AP hip radiograph and to address how to assess limb length discrepancy. This is a, a representative X-ray showing uh, how pelvic obliquity necessitates modifying your inclination of the cup. And of course, uh, proximal femoral canal uh, characteristics may will obviously uh, define what kind of components uh, you want to implant in the femur. Going to implants and instrumentation, cemented versus instrumented is a very uh, old debate. Cemented, uncemented implants are currently uh, of or choice implants, but there, there may be some uh, uh, reasons where you may want to prefer uh, cemented implants like patients who are old, have rheumatoid and soft bone or have wide canals. Uh, you also have to have instruments to extract any existing metal work, for example, hip screws or special implants for uh, based on what you templated. Like if uh, uh, you may need smaller cups or stems uh, for smaller, smaller patients or dual mobility uh, implants for high risk patients you know, who have high risk for dislocation. I think it's a good idea to have some kind of a circular system in the operating room because broaching, you know, it's not infrequent to uh, crack the calcar while broaching and you know, having a wire always is always reassuring. Uh, again, uh, how, what approach to use is a historic debate. Both are equally good. Posterior, posterior people uh, you know, argue that all, uh, all dislocations uh, are because of people not uh, uh, doing the posterior approach well. And uh, the anterior guys think that uh, it's, it, it, the, the approach was not well done, which is why they had the limb. But uh, I think uh, both are equally good. Although you might, wa you might want to weigh one versus the other in, in specific uh, patients like 
uh, high risk people with high risk of uh, dislocation, you might want you might prefer an anterolateral approach instead of a postlateral. Or, for example, if someone's uh, abductors have been violated by an iron nail in the uh, you know putting an iron nail, maybe then taking it out, you may want to use a postlateral approach. Um, something to consider. Uh, Pre-assessing the patient then, having the anesthetist to review the patient, assessing his overall health and fitness for anesthesia. Consulting other specialists and addressing whatever is addressable. All of it may not be addressable, but whatever is has to be addressed. You have to push, optimize the patient in terms of the hemoglobin, your blood sugar, renal function. With their medication, some, have, some are on blood thinners. These may need to be, uh, these may need to be uh, you know, stopped at a certain time before surgery. EMARs are usually considered safe, uh, methotrexate, it should not it should not be started, but uh, drugs like biologic response modifiers, etanercept, uh, infliximab, these need to be stopped before surgery and for two weeks after. Patient has to be nutritionally optimized. Problems like alcohol and tobacco, tobacco should be should be addressed. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, como, like people have people have having depression and anxiety, they have to be sent to uh, the respective specialists to address these things because they have a direct bearing on patient satisfaction after surgery. Discussing the patient, uh, discussing the surgery with the patient is paramount. You have to, you know, it, it may it may take the form of prior counseling in the form of a joint school, which we do here in the UK, where the patient is told about the surgery, what to expect, when to come into hospital, what kind of anesthesia to expect, how how what the what the surgery entails, how long to uh, how long a hospital stay to expect, and how to uh, you know how to uh, start uh, you know their normal normal activity afterwards. Uh, what kind of activity they can do after? They should be clear about this. Any postural limitations? It's it's no use having a patient go back home two weeks and coming back two weeks after because they sat uh, on their low commode and and the hip hip uh, popped out up uh, posteriorly. So all these things have to be explained to the patient. The patient has to be taken into confidence. We have to work with the patient. This is not our operation. This is their operation. And of course, post-operative rehab in in the form of exercise and physiotherapy. These should never be undermined. Lastly, consenting for the patient. We have to explain the procedure to the patient, explain what it entails, explain what the purpose is. The purpose is pain relief and improved function, but then there are attendant complications like Dr. Kani uh, so well mentioned. It's, it's, it's best to uh, warn them about potential complication, not scare them, but warn them, telling them at the same time that these are, this, is the, this is the relative risk of this complication. It's, it's best the patient be prepared for a slightly longer or shorter leg than be shocked after and you risk litigation. And of course, give them the alt alternatives to, uh, to this operation. Make, them, make this their decision rather than imposing this on them. Uh, and in the post-op period, do they need ICU or HDU? This should be taken care of uh, uh, prior. What kind of analgesia they will have? You, you should have a policy, your own protocol in place, and then tailor it according to the patient's needs. Thromboprophylaxis, low ultraviolet heparin or aspirin, whatever floats your boat, use that. Obviously, tailor it to the patient's uh, respective needs. And then, of course, therapy. Uh, we all like to see this x-ray, and we think the THR is about this, but I think it's more about a happy patient because that is the greater purpose. I hope that I did some justice to it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gani. Uh, a very good presentation. Can I invite uh, Dr. Sanjeev Gupta, close friend, on types of implants and total hip replacement? Sanjeev? Yes. Hi, good evening. So my talk is implants and THR. As the THR devices involve two primary components, which is the femoral and the acetabular components. The total components on the femoral side is the head, neck, and the stem. And then there's the acetabular component. Goal of a sound, stable hip joint is restoration of normal center of rotation of the head which means getting the right vertical offset, right horizontal offset, and right version. So medial restoration is simply corrected by making neck adjustments, but they can be limb lengthening, alternating. Uh, uh, there could be alter, uh, alteration of the limb length. A more medial neck position increases offset without changing the height. Hence, limb length is unaffected. 
Normal femoral version is 10 to 15 degrees. It's usually accomplished by rotating the component in the femoral canal. And if press fit design is used, modular component is used. Important to count is the head neck ratio. For a given neck diameter, implant with smaller head will have lesser arc of motion than the larger one. And also a jump distance, which means subluxation with a smaller head has shorter distance to travel than the larger one. Hence, a large femoral head is theoretically more stable than a smaller one. So it's preferable to have a large head size because it increases the range of motion, decreases the impingement, has less chance of dislocation, less wear, and more stability compared to the small head. So coming to the types of femoral components could be cemented stems, cementless stems, or specialized custom-made stems. Cemented stems are mostly of cobalt chrome alloy, and PMMA cement is the standard for femoral component fixation. Disadvantages of cementing are there could be debonding, mechanical loosening, extensive loss of the bone with some fragmented cement. Current size of the stems varies from 120 to 150 millimeters. Commonly used stem is a CPT stem, it's the colorless, polished, and tempered stem, and design allows control subsidence and maintains the compressive forces all around the tip of the stem. There could be the summit stems, which is integral proximal PMMA spacer and additional centralizer, which facilitate the proper stem positioning. There could be omnifit ion stems, which is normal proximal texturing, converts shear forces into the compressive forces. Could be spectron stem, rounded rectangular shape and optional grooves, which improve the rotational stability. Then coming to the cementless stems, cementless is more of a biological fixation. Material used is the titanium alloy or the cobalt chrome alloy. Bone in growth into the porous metal surface uh, helps in holding the stem. It requires immediate me mechanical stability at the time of surgery and immediate contact between porous surface and viable porous bone. So surgical technique and instruments need to be more precise than the cemented counterpart. There are six types of cementless femoral stems. So type one to five are straight stems with fixation areas increases with the type and type six is the anatomical kind of a stem. So type one stems are single wedge stems which are flat in the AP plane and tapered in the medial lateral plane. And fixation is by cortical engagement in medial lateral plane and three bony point fixation. Type two stems have dual wedge stem and engage in both AP and medial lateral planes. Type three space stems have implant tapered in two planes, but fixation is achieved more at the metaphysical diaphysical junction. Type four stems are extensively coated implants with fixation along the entire length of the stem. Type five are the modular stems which are separate metaphysical sleeves and diaphysical segment that are independent, independently sized and instrumented. Type six, as we said, is anatomical femoral component. It incorporates the posterior bow in the metaphysical portion and anterior bow in the diaphysical portion, corresponding to the normal geometry of the femoral canal. Then there are specialized custom-made stems which have femoral components for replacement of variable length of the proximal femur. And stems can be even combined with TKR to replace the entire femur. Useful in various congenital conditions, trauma, tumors, and previous surgeries. Coming to the estable components, they could be again cemented, cementless, or constrained. Cemented estable components have a PMM spacer of around 3 mm incorporated into the polymerizing cement yielding uninterrupted cement mantle all around the uh, component. It is satisfactory in elderly low demand patients and in revision arthroplasty. Cemented, cementless estable components have a porous coat for bone and growth and fixation is done with trans-estable screws. 
constrained acetabular component have a mechanism to lock the prosthetic femoral head into the polythenol liner and indications are insufficient soft tissues deficient hip abductors neuromuscular disease hip with recurrent dislocation despite well positioned implants various kinds of alternative bearings are highly cross linked polythylene metal on metal ceramic on ceramic highly cross linked polythene have been shown to have 80 to 90% reduction in wear with highly cross linked polythenes high dose of radiation leads to formation of highly cross linked polymer structure and they compatible with most existing modular acetabular components metal on metal bearings have a low bear wear rate high carbon cobalt chromium alloys but the only disadvantage is they have a lot of elevation of metal ions in blood that excreted by urine and they content contraindicated in renal failures they also can cause delayed type hypersensitivity and recommended for symptomatic patients uh, measurement of blood and levels of cobalt and chromium ion levels ceramic on ceramic bearings have a alumina ceramic is used high dense hydrophilic smoother than metal ceramics harder than metal and more resistant to scratching linear weighted is 4000 times less than cobalt chrome alloy disadvantage is it causes something can have chipping implant malposition stripe wear squeaking and osteolysis so a brief comparison is metal on polythene polythene have large volume evidence in support predictable life span cost effective metal on metal have longer life span than polythene but there's chance of metallosis and potential carcinogenic effects ceramic on ceramic have low friction low debris and inert substance but there is side effect that this noise and squeaking and they are slightly expensive so ideal bearing surface is a surface which has low coefficient of friction small volume of wear particle generation low tissue reaction to wear particles and high resistance to third body wear so thank you so much so these were the various types of implants in thr which is cemented cementless components thank you thank you dr uh, sanjeev uh, really nice presentation thank you i was just worried that you'll going to cover my bits of the topic as well okay now the next talk is by rohit himself and he'll be talking on the various current concepts in bearings and how to choose the correct implant over to rohit thank you uh, sanjeev uh, thank you uh, abdul to invite me uh, i think sanjeev has covered a bit of the topic uh, on this but i'm going to uh, do my presentation based on the available literature and what i've searched in the past few years this is where i come from uh, from lincolnshire east of uh, england we cover a large uh, area we've got uh, 11 hospitals uh, three of them do joint arthroplasty and we do about 1500 joints a year so if you look at the history of the bearing services it started way back in 1840 when the first uh, hip arthroplasty was attempted using wooden blocks clearly it didn't work then uh, later in the 19th century they used soft tissue interposition ivory balls uh, robert jones used uh, gold foil and smith patterson used vitalium molds so Judith Brothers used an acrylic hip, which had an early success, and then it failed miserably. Austin Moore was designed way back in 1950. It was not till McKee, George McKee for Norfolk and Norwich, who designed the first metal-on-metal -metal hip uh, in 1953, which had some success. And uh, John Charnley in 60s and 70s developed the concept of low-friction arthroplasty, which took the total hip replacement to new heights. so these are the different types of hips as been previously discussed by previous presenters we do cemented uncemented hybrid reverse hybrid uh, and various kinds of hips so i'm going to focus my talk only on the bearing surfaces what is tribology well, it's a science of interactive surfaces in relative motion so you want to incorporate the concept of wear 
concept of friction and lubrication. And that is important when we're discussing which uh, bearing surface to use and when to use. And also remember there are primary bearing surfaces like uh, ceramic on poly, uh, you can have a primary bearing surface of ceramic on poly, but there might be a secondary bearing surface on ceramic on metal and uh, poly on uh, metal, which is behind the polyethylene which you put in the stubbler component. So that's something you need to uh, be aware of. So what is an ideal bearing surface? The ideal bearing surface should have a low coefficient of friction, have a small volume of uh, wear, uh, a part, a particle de de uh, generation, low tissue reaction to wear particles so it doesn't cause uh, any pseudo tumors or any tissue uh, toxicity. It should have high resistance to third body wear if any particles or any uh, bone debris has been left in, doesn't cause any uh, wear. And it gives enough deformation to articular surface to pr permit adequate fluid fill uh, lubrication. We know that fuel fill lubrication is the best form of lubrication uh, during the stance uh, phase without increasing wear. So it's always a debate, hard on hard or hard on soft, which one to use. What's the surgeon's perspective? The surgeon wants to have an uh, implant which is cost-effective uh, within, within uh, reasonable means. It has good wear uh, qualities and it has a predictable failure rate. Uh, you need to have a size which is acceptable, not too big, so it doesn't increase the wear uh, too quickly or it's not too small that the jump distance is too small and results in dislocation. So it is, should be stable. Uh, it should bear in mind the patient's demand. We understand the patient's demands are changing. And most importantly, uh, from the Indian perspective, we need to use an implant which is available in India because we I'm aware a lot of implants which we use, sometimes it takes a few years for them to be available and some of the implants are not available in some parts of the world. So if you look at the head size and the dislocation we, we, or the volumetric wear, we see the bigger the uh, head size, the more the volumetric wear. As we discussed previously by Dr. Abdul Ghani that the demands of the patients are changing. A lot of patients are going back to doing other activities including playing golf, uh, uh, double tennis, or even going rock climbing. Why is the debate for alternative bearing services? We are doing hips in more younger, fitter patients, and they have high demands. They want to get back to the normal activities, the 20 years old, the 30 years old, the 40 years old. So we need to have a way where we can have long-term fixation of these implants. We need to have the predictive failure. So we know that polyethylene fails over a period of time. That's why highly cross-linked poly uh, has been developed. They cause osteolysis, they cause aseptic losing. We need to develop bearing surfaces that can function at high level and for a prolonged life of a well-fixed implant. So I'm gonna discuss mainly the four bearing surfaces, though there are other bearing surfaces which I'll touch upon, uh, uh, which is metal on poly, metal on metal, ceramic on poly and ceramic on poly, uh, uh, ceramic. We know that the volumetric wear is inversely proportional to the hardness, the soft test bearing surface. So, the, when I did the presentation, we've, I've looked at all the uh, bearing surfaces and looked at what's the volumetric wear per year. And we can see uh, metal on poly gives a volumetric wear of 200 microns per year, whereas ceramic on ceramic gives uh, one micron a year. But a good uh, compromise is ceramic on poly, which gives less than 10 uh, microns in a year and has the benefits of less volumetric wear, as well as uh, we can uh, decrease the cost by not using a ceramic on the decreases the complication, uh, which has been discussed by Dr. Gupta on ceramic on ceramic. So methodology of this presentation was we used, I used the in vitro and clinical data on the wear of available bearing couples. I used the Na national joint registry data for the last 15, 16 years from NGR and other joint registries, looked at the systemic reviews, instructional lectures and RCTs based on purely on uh, bearing surfaces and how we can use it. So when we use the bearing surfaces on the NGR, we see that metal on poly is decreasing over the period of time and ceramic on poly is increasing. We used to use uh, ceramic metal on metal 10 years ago, that has dipped down quite a lot. If we look at the uns, uns this, the top line is the cemented, the middle one is the uncemented, where we look at 2010, the metal on metal or 2007 to 8, to, uh, metal on metal 
was quite high in the uncemented group, which has now gone to almost zero to less than 0.1. And the hybrids, which are being used more and more, the ceramic on poly is being increased. And we see a gradual trend of ceramic on poly being used more and more in uh, in majority of the hip replacements in, as per the National Joint Registry in UK. And these are the different, uh, if we look at just the numbers from two, up till 2016, that the cemented metal on poly is still being the most commonly used, whereas cemented ceramic on poly, uh, we're increasing the numbers. And the same is true for uncemented as well as for the hybrid. And if you look at the uh, failure rates, we can see that failure rates are more in the, um, the patients with metal on metal hips. And that's why we're using more, less and less of them. If you look at the Finnish joint registry and the Swedish joint registry, which are mainly doing uh, uh, cemented hips, again, there, the, the majority of the people are suggesting that a ceramic on poly is performing much better than the other hips. If you look at the New Zealand joint registry, sorry, if you look at the New Zealand joint registry, ceramic on polyethylene has the lowest all cause revision rate of 0.54 per 100 component years, uh, followed by metal on uh, polyethylene and metal on metal bearing surfaces has the highest revision rate of 1.43 per 100 uh, component years and was significantly inferior to ceramic on polyethylene, which was statistically significant. And according to that registry, ceramic on polyethylene remains the most durable and successful coupling in primary total hip replacement, irrespective of age, gender, and size of the femoral head. There has been some papers reported on the novel bearing surfaces, like hydrophilic polyurethane has been used, and there have been two short some studies with increased failure rates, and they were taken off from the market, and carbon fiber enforced uh, uh, CR peak. I, I know there, uh, there was a CR peak. Uh, femoral components being made, and I'm aware of development of CR peak knees being uh, made as well. But they, these are very early results, and we haven't got enough data to uh, present it. We know that there are problems with hard on hard surfaces, uh, very limited role in my practice on metal on metal. Uh, it has fallen out of favor in majority of uh, in UK, apart from Birmingham, who does few resurfacing, majority of us uh, only revise them, don't resurface them. Ceramic on metal, there has been few papers, especially from Greek, uh, uh, but that has again gone out of favor. What do we know? We know that they've caused lots of toxicology. There have been reports of carcinogenesis, tetragenicity, and hypersensitivity to metal on metal. Problems with ceramic on ceramic, squeaking, as uh, Sanjeev mentioned, is a phenomenon which is unique to this, uh, particularly on ceramic on uh, ceramic. Uh, there is a risk of implant deformation, ceramic fractures, uh, we presented this uh, for a best practice tariff, how to uh, best practice how to revise this uh, fracture ceramic bearings in published in Journal of Arthroplasty a few years ago. Hard and soft bearing surfaces, metal on poly. Now the highly crosslink poly has the longest survivorship. This was uh, initially uh, Charlie used a metal on poly, which now the, we've improved the poly because we knew it was a predictable failure rate of poly in 12 to 13 years. So now we're using highly highly crosslink poly. Ceramic on poly gives a benefit of low wear rate and is a good compromise between metal on polyethylene and ceramic on ceramic. And the failure is more predictable. Majority of joint registries now showing trend towards uh, ceramic on polyethylene. My choice of hip bearings, ceramic on polyethylene in majority of the patients less than 65, ceramic on ceramic in very young less than 40, though I'm now moving more towards doing ceramic on polyethylene at every age because I know the failure rate is more predictable and metal on polythene in patients more than 70. Between 60 and 65 and 70, I judge on patients' physiological age rather than uh, chronological age. Metal on metal has no role in my practice at least, and I've never used uh, metal on ceramic, and probably will never use. This is what we use in ODEP uh, in UK. We've, uh, I am uh, just become one of the panel members of ODEP, which is our orthopedic uh, data evaluation panel, where we evaluate every, uh, orthopedic implant, which is introduced in UK, and we rate them based on what their failure rate is. So if some surgeons are trying to look at the implant and they want to use it, I think it's worthwhile going on to this website, odep.org.uk, and look at the, the failure rates. So 
They will have a 10A star rating, which means they have less than 5% of failure rate at 10 years or 13A star or 15A star. So uh, unless it's a very new implant, even then you can go into the website and look at beyond compliance and see what's the failure rate. And that will give you an idea whether to start using this implant or not. In conclusion, all combination of burning surfaces have their advantages and disadvantages as we understand uh, from the patient's perspective and the surgeon perspective, what we can use. Metal on metal and ceramic on metal have fallen out of favor. Best bearing surface for an individual patient, it is necessary to analyze the specific implication for each patient. In very young patient, there's a trade-off between long-term low wear from a ceramic on ceramic or a small risk of fracture and squeaking. The perfect bearing surface uh, still remains an enigma. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, excellent talk with a lot of illustrations. Uh, now we have some time for discussion. Uh, we have short over by around 10 minutes. So we would have only probably five to seven minutes to discuss the previous uh, five talks. So yeah. if there are any questions among the faculty, we can uh, ask. Yeah, Manoj, please. Yeah, Rohit. Rohit, uh, you spoke about ceramic on ceramic with the new Biolox Delta ceramic. Have you seen any ceramic fracture? Because all we keep voting is a past. Now, I, I agree. Uh, the Biolux Delta does seems to work better, but there have been some results where the malpositioning of especially the astabular component, because it doesn't give. So if when we are using, when whenever we're putting an implant in, there is a bit of give when we put, uh, un, we put an uncemented uh, uh, cup. In a very young, fit, healthy male, that give is a bit less than uh, what we use. And the problem is sometimes they fit and get stuck and we, 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 we are not sure. And it becomes difficult to remove and it's, it's a catch 22 position whether to leave it or not. And th those are the problems where we, we, we have an issue. And that's why the newer highly cross-linked polyethylene gives exactly the same results. If you look at the registry data, uh, which covers elite surgeons like yourself to an average surgeon, uh, like myself to everybody, it becomes easier for us to look at and say, for an average person, this implant works well. And that is, that is the key. Uh, yes, you can use ceramic on ceramic, but I think if we individualize and make sure that we only use in very young and fit patients, it'll become easier. And then we can use ceramic on poly. You decrease the cost and the wear rate is similar. Yeah, that's what I said. Uh, in India, per se, the cost is almost similar. Every meeting you go through, you hear about ceramics on two issues. What is the downside of ceramic on ceramic? A, it would give you a fracture. Second, it would give you a squeak. I believe with the newer stuff, both of them do not exist. So when we have a competitive, yes, ceramic on poly is a safer bet. No second thoughts about that. But definitely, do you feel there is an absolute indication for uh, a certain age group or certain quality of lifestyle where you would still place ceramic on ceramic as one choice? I think in very young patients, yes, you can think about ceramic on uh, ceramic as a choice. I agree with the fact that squeaking and as well as fractures have decreased with the newer uh, ceramic, uh, newer generation ceramics, and I fully agree with that. But uh, the number is not zero. And in a safe, in a in a person, a high volume surgeon like yourself, probably it is safe. But uh, an occasional surgeon, the mes message I'm trying to give a person who does less than 300 or 400 joints a year. And if he's doing 300, 400 joints a year, maybe he's only doing 20 to 30 ceramic on ceramics. Because if he follows the right indication, in that case, it is safer to use a ceramic on poly, which will give you equally wear rate, or you can have a bit of compromise. Unless you're doing 20, 30 years old, fair enough. In a 50, 60 year old, we, we still know that newer polys are doing really well. Any place for oxygenium? Very last tips. Oxygenium and crawling has to. Uh, that's uh, that's why I put that slide, which I've only put in uh, uh, last night on ODEM. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worthwhile. It it's opens up your mind when a rep comes and says, this is the best thing we have come because we've quoted this with the oxygenium and it works really well. And you look at the data where the data is from either Australian joint registries or a, a national joint registry in UK and look at the data. The data speaks louder than words where 
the results are not what is quoted by the companies. The companies will, and I'm, I'm, I do work with the companies, the companies will tell skewed data where they want to tell you what is what you want to hear. I think the key bit is you look at the long-term results. We, uh, that's why when we, the persona has been introduced and the tone, uh, tune is introduced in UK, they had to go through beyond compliance where each patient was followed very closely and any failure rate was picked up. And I think that's, that's what the message I'm trying to give uh, through this, that when you're trying to use an implant, a new one, please look at uh, the data, especially with the auxinium. The one thing which people have reported is the streaks and the lines where this auxinium coating has been removed and the metal is visible, which, which makes defeats the purpose of using auxinium. Any, any other questions? Doctor, Doctor, I, Manoj, Dr. Manoj, Manoj, sorry, Asha. I, I have a yeah. question in chat box. I have one question uh, for Dr. Haseeb. Is it advisable to do the uh, replacements in this Corona times? And if so, is there any preoperative planning, anything specific required? Yeah. Um... First of all, uh, we, I think we, uh, our discussion is in the context of elective primary total hips, yeah. and uh, they should be done in as safe a manner as possible. Uh, in the context of Corona, I mean, there's a huge backlog here in the UK of uh, patients piling up, dated for three months, who are now who are, not, who are waiting for these operations, and now we have come. Uh, we, we, we have, uh, like uh, Dr. Ambani mentioned, uh, there's a policy has been made where green sites have been identified uh, and uh, lists allocate, I mean, lists devised. It's, it's, it's still the beginning. I don't think uh, uh, we haven't done a joint in my hospital yet. I think uh, we're planning to do our first joint this, this week now, uh, where all the staff who is, who is, who is uh, staffing that site is swapped. They have a fit desk with a mask so that you know the, uh, the, there is no so, so the mask fitting is uh, proper they have they have they have cold swabs they uh, do not uh, they are not involved in the care of uh, ward patients for a week prior the patients are called in and asked to isolate for two weeks uh, prior to surgery and then come in so all of this is done with um, with with whatever whatever evidence has evolved in the last because this is all very new no one no one was prepared to do this before so these steps have been taken we have identified green sites uh, we are asking patients to isolate for two weeks prior we are asking the team involved to be not involved in the care of you know of of, of, of ward patients have uh, fit testing anyone with a temperature has to isolate anyone who is not well cannot go there. Uh, Ideally, we have been uh, keeping staff off for the week prior. I mean, uh, uh, the trainees and the surgeons, they have a week off prior to their elective operating week. Uh, this, is, this is just a trial run. We don't know how this will evolve uh, because we haven't done it yet, but this is the policy that has been put in place. Right. Thank you. I think that's the end of the session, uh, first session. Now I hand over to Dr. Abdul Ghani to start with the next session. Uh, yeah. Can I now request Dr. Manoj Vadva to start sh sharing screen? He is going to speak. Uh, uh, will be speaking two, three lectures actually, rather four lectures, almost uh, more of a technical point. We had the background so far, so let's go exactly to the theater now with Dr. Manoj Vadva. Thank you. Yeah, Abdul, I think I am on screen right now. Yeah, you are. Yeah. yeah. So thanks, Dr. Abdul, for giving me the opportunity now. I have uh, 40 minutes at my disposal. And uh, over the next few minutes, I will take you as a sequence. We will talk about different approaches. Uh, my first part will be the posterior approach, which is a working horse, gold standard for everybody. I will also give you a quick glimpse of the direct interior approach, which is how you take the hip from the front. We will talk about the important tips and tricks to do a femoral preparation, to do a SW preparation, both cemented and uncemented in the next few minutes. So the first case is a posterior approach, total hip replacement. 52-year-old female, hypertensive, five years, right hip placed way back in 2010. 
and has a shortening of 1 cm harris score pre op is 35 as you see out here a case of oa and uh, there is a 1 cm shortening as per the marking drawn in the position is direct lateral you have to make sure when you position these hips you have a sacral support you have a pubic support and your shoulder is absolutely flat on because your back has to be vertical to the table you do not have an impingement you can see your flexion my insane is insane of uh, thirds so normal insane is 1/3 distal to trochanter and 2/3 proximal to trochanter this is the live so i am keeping a better one normally insanes are around 8 or 9 cm per se so you cut through the skin the pudens tissues this is a posterior lateral modified gibson approach this is where your greater uh, trochanter is So in this case, you will cut over the fascia, the tendinous fascia, and when you reach over the gluteus maximus, it's all a blunt dissection. You have the tendinous portions later on out here. Develop a plane, put your finger inside with a blunt dissection, go in the plane and sort of blunt splitting of gluteus maximus. Once you have done that, you have your fingers on the twentric fascia. You have different kind of channel depending on the obesity. You can use a larger blade or a smaller blade. Use wet mop sponges. Put up a channel retractor. So see what marking you are because if you are going to work for your limb length deformity, I want to see. You need to know where you are. This is the gluteus maximus which I've marked up. I hardly ever release the gluteus maximus except in very very tight hips where it is very tough to do an anterior direction of the femur. So take out the bulk and the soft tissues. Once you've taken these out, you are going to feel the external rotators. So this is a coaxial stitch, a technique that I use for restoration of limb length. I'll tell you two, three tricks that we use during surgery. So you use this athy bond, develop a marker. While doing this, very, very particular, you have to be at a constant level of your position of flexion of the hip. What I was trying to show through is you flex or extend the hip, you will move ahead. So you have retracted the gluteus medius and minimus. This is the piriformis. Develop a tag in the piriformis. Once you develop a tag. you can go down along the bone and take off your two gamela and obturator internus and the quadratus to some extent then flexion edduction internal rotation my capsular flap is along with the rotators you dislocate the hip mark the center of rotation this is the medial offset you have the trochanteric tip say around 45 mm this is ranavat's infracontract groove This is you put your step in the intercontinental steamer pin again. Remember the position where you have checked in. Mark it onto the femur. This will help you to restore because we are one centimeter short. We do not want to over lengthen the limb as the previous speakers already spoke up. So this is your neck section template. Depending on the kind of implant you are using on, you can do your neck section, which is based on the preoperative templating. Take out the head. See what size is it? Like forty-five. Because this helps me. Where do I start with the remus? Now at this stage, I retract the gluteus medius and put up a steam pin on top of it. This is anterior capsulectomy. Put up a hook. Take the femur forward. This anterior wall retractor goes on and takes the femur ahead. So at this stage, erase the reflected head of rectus femoris. The turning side. This is the cobra that is used beneath the tal transverse tabular ligament. So the head end is at the top. The tail end is the bottom side. Put another pin in the ischial tuberosity, which will help you doing a self retention. So you have one pin on the top, one pin on the back. You can use this kind of posterior inferior retractor, where the axilla moves on to the ischial tuberosity. So once you've done this, take out the labrum. So you need to have, even with an MI approach, also 360 degree view of the stabulum. I use these kind of offset graters. which is very important if you are doing a direct intake approach which is showing the next surgery so you start the reaming has to be very punctuate you first ream medially then you ream anatomical and at the last reach functional so the medial reaming anatomical reaming functional reaming go sequentially high put in the sign of greater these are the normal stabular positioners you have to take care of your inclination and inversion this is the r3 cup with a strictite coating on top of it uncemented cup This is one of my favorite hemispherical cups that I use on. And normally, in course, would not even use it. So once you put in this, you see your stability. If need be, you put in the screws. Your cup has to be in line with the tail. There are different landmarks to position this cup. 
So you have, what is your level of inclination, your NK version? So you want to put in screws, you put up a trial. In majority of the simple kind of cases, I would take off the trial and put my definitive uh, liner. This is a high posterior wall liner. So in all tough cases, I would at this stage keep just a trial in so that subsequently you can check onto the combined antiversion, then put in. See your liner is well fixed in, put up a gauze inside and you're coming back to the femur. Use this kind of anterior femur elevators. This cobra goes around the lesser trochanter. While starting this femur, use a small hook because a small punch of bone on the middle side of trochanter is very, very important to be taken out because otherwise you'll put your femoral component in virus. So use this kind of box osteotome to take out this punch of bone on the middle part of trochanter. So once the box is done, you have this canal finder. Then you have these kind of brooches. So one goes onto the lateral side, which takes off the bone onto the middle part of the canter and other sort of repairs your calcar area. We just want compaction. These are the compaction guides, the starter tools. Then you go sequentially up. These are special inserters, angled inserters, because for all minimally invasive approaches that we use through, we need these kind of specialized instrumentation. So go sequentially in, Keep increasing the size till the time you hear a speaking noise. Then you will also find that your brooches are not moving in. You can see what kind of trial stems you want, standard or lateralized, high offset stems. So do your trialing. See that you're not impinging. See that your limb length is restored. Then take this out. Do an irrigation pulsatile lavage. This is a hydroxy appetite coated standardized femoral stem. Impact it. We normally allow even our unsmanded hips to load within three hours after surgery. So you have to be very, very particular how well you impact it. If your bone is soft, you're not in, you have to then hold on for a couple of weeks. This is where you find your hip was loose. So you'll go one size up. Once you go one size up, the hip should move in easily. Then you have to check on with your coplanar test, a simple test. You put your heel and your knees. That's a vague test. But going from this on to this Coaxial stitch test, where we check on, we have lengthened around one centimeter, if you see at the previous mark, to the new one. Same with this infocotylate mark also, we are lengthened around one centimeter, which is the normal limb length now. We have equalized the limb length. There is no impingement, the shock taste, the push-pull taste, all these parameters are done to see you're not impinging. And this is how your cup has to be looking on, with the right kind of inclination and antiversion. So this was a bit about the posterior approach. Now I'm going to show you a glimpse on the direct anterior approach, which is what we are using these days. Now you have to erase all memories that you had for the posterior approach because direct anterior approach is supine on the table. If I'm going to use without a special table, it is intermuscular, internervous. We can even do bilateral total hip investment single sitting. These are very specialized instrumentation you require and a steep learning curve for this. These are special DA instruments with long lever arms and handles. These are the kind of offset graters you saw me using even for the posterior approach. But for DA, they've become very, very important. 53-year-old male, post-traumatic secondary arthrosis, left hip, digital auto hip templating. You see what size of the femoral component you need to have, whether you want a standardized or you want a high offset stem. This patient is supine on the table. I use a table-less approach. You can use a longitudinal or a bikini NCM. This is with a longitudinal NCM. So around eight centimeter, you start two centimeter distal and posterior to AASS heading towards the head of fibula. So your plane is on the tensor fascia lata. This is a very low one. You have to prevent the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh and you enter in the plane between the TFL and the sartorius. So you first you saw was lateral cutaneous nerve and this is lateral circumflex vessels on the anterior part of the hip, which you have to ligate or cauterize. And this structure, the right structure is the anterior hip capsule. You do an interior hip capsulectomy, or you can do an H or Y capsulectomy also. Then you do an in situ neck section. If it is very tough, you can take a double wafer and then take out the remaining part of hip inside a fused hip. Once you put this, put up a cock screw and lever out the femoral head. The head comes out, and your SW lies directly in front of you. SW exposure is pretty easy. What is tough is the femoral exposure. This is a specialized tool for 
protecting the femur. This is the offset grater. Normally, if you want to use a simple grater, it becomes tougher, it damages soft tissues. Once you've done your grating, avoid excessive antiversion and inclination because if you are a pushy approach user, you have to density to put your hips in higher amount of antiversion inclination. This is the establishment foot in. It's very, very easy in the anterior approach because you see structures right in front of you. You see your direct antiversion and inclination of your cup. Once your definitive cup is put in, you can again, as per choice, use in the screws. You put up your definitive liner, put up a gauze piece, impact it through. And then comes the femur. Femur is the mainstay. You can cause a hyperextension of the table at this stage. You first release the pubofemoral ligament, which is the inferior capsule. With a hook, pull the femur up and out. This, this step is a very crucial. Femoral mobilization is the key for direct interior approach. You go superiorly and release the obturator internus. Once your femur is mobilized out of the stabulum, you use these box osteotomes and angled remus, angled brooches. You have a tendency to put perforate the posterior cortex, so your entry portal has to be very, very perfect. Sequentially keep broaching till the time you are definitely in the space. You sequentially larger broaches till the time you have a sound and your broach stops impacting any further. A trial hip. In an interior approach, it's very, very easy to see on your restoration of limb length because you are directly standing there. You can touch the heels. You can see the malleoli. You can do a lazy test. You can feed for malleoli. You can see the tibial tuberosities. You can see the heels. So at this stage, you have a choice whether you want to use a standard or a high offset stem, depending on what you want to use in. So once your trial is comfortable, that's at that stage in which you put up your definitive component. As I told you, prevent perforation of the posterior cortex. See your trialing back again. See that you are not impinging. Your coplanar taste is good. You have a full range of motion you, in extension and external tension. Your hip does not come out. So remember, this approach is totally intermuscular, internabus. You have not cut any muscle. This is the oxanium head on a highly cross-linked polyethylene. Once you've done this, again, you come back. See that you restored the hip length. You can see your range of motion. You're not causing any impingement. You have a full arc of motion going through. Once you have checked on that your length is fine, you have restored the functional range of motion without any impingement, you go back and close these hips. So these hips are uh, have a steep learning curve, but once you understand these approaches, they are far less morbid. So from here on, we head on to the part of talks. Uh, the first one, I'll start off with approaches, the technical details on the videos that we discussed through. The first part would be the posterior approach. So on synopsis of the approach is that normally the literature says we follow through is anterior Smith, Peterson's approach, anterolateral Watson Jones approach, Harding, which my friends in UK will tell me because this is one of the most commonly practiced approach, direct lateral across, transtrochantric and posterolateral, which is like an extensile approach for majority of the revision surgeons. We have new approaches, minimally invasive posterior approach that we normally use and the direct anterior approach that you rightly saw. So on a comparison of each approach that we, you follow the hand, open the hip, I mean, you open the door to the front on the right or the left, but the idea is what you're trying to look in. You see the recovery time, you see hospital stay, you see the NCL length, wound cause passes versus what as uh, the OD operating and other uh, Australian industry says, what is the complication rate? What is implant survival ship? But more than that, what is functionally good in your hands? So forget about what the industry says. What is very important is any approach that is versatile for you you can use in bigger parameters. Like I would, uh, as Dr. Ramani also said, direct interior approach is only for people who do higher volumes because uh, with a smaller volume, it is not one approach you can apply on all those fused ankylosed hips. It's very, very tough. Posterior approach is still the gold standard. Lateral decubitus position, as you saw in the insane that you saw through with blunt split of gluteus maximus. I hardly ever release a tendon of gluteus maximus. And uh, piriformis and short external rotators are released off. Once you do that, your sciatic nerve is automatically prevented. Uh, the advantage is it's familiar to most surgeons, preserves the abductor function, which is the problem with the lateral approaches, 
good exposure of femur and its development extensile uh, allows use of trochanteric slide and extended trochanteric osteotomy for all those revision surgeries and with the recent studies in multiple cases we have seen that uh, if you do your trans trochanteric repair well which i'll show you in the next few steps the dislocation rate which is the biggest complication is less than 1% but soft tissue repair has to be optimal your implant positions has to be right your chance chances and the kind of implant fixation has to be appropriate your position has to be dead lateral you i use is i've been trained by dr chitranavat so trochanteric loop stitches are very very important we pass them in this hip is reduced posterior capsule and rotators the piriformis and rotators pass through the trans osseous sutures this is how it comes on as a flap with the capsule the sutures are tight and you have a totally stable hip once you do the protocols pretty well i hardly ever require uh, dual mobility also which is only for parkinson's or neurological patients your hips work perfectly well now talking about the lateral or the interlateral approaches which is uh, still in uk and other places a uh, good workhorse these approaches vary depending on the site of the gluteus medius split now you can do these approaches in the lateral as well as supine position rothman would do it supine a lot of uk surgeons do it lateral the idea of the benefit of a position in the lateral is in the lateral you have a good view to the system the orientation is easier but the limb length equalization is tougher and you have to use systems like the one i show you multiple parameters to make sure that you have restored your length in a supine position the limb length equalization is very very easy but the orientation and assistant uh, viewing is poor the advantage of interlateral approach is uh, it gives you good exposure of acetabulum it very easy to judge acetabular position very low dislocation rate but the disadvantage is, is the limb because uh, in couple of cases you have a potential abductor weakness although if you repair your abductors well in the hands of an expert this would hardly be a complication harding or modified harding lateral approach is a workhorse where you take the gluteus medius and uh, this one uh, the vastus lateralis as a single sleeve flap you raise it entirely you hope the uh, sort of release the hip from the front the anterior capsule and you do a decapitation this is the gluteus maximus and medius and the vastus medialis you raise a flap you reach to the gluteus minimus which is raised your head is exposed after the capsule lot me you have a wonderful acetabular exposure because the stabulum in all these approaches is like directly in front of you your positioning of uh, acetabulum for the inclination and diversion is comparatively easier you do these uh, exposures you do put a punctured marks and for a cemented cup kind of flange cup or lpw wall or neutral wall whatever you want you can put these kind of cups in the femur exposure is a figure of 4 this is how you expose the calcar and the femur area you put in your definitive cemented components check on to the right kind of version repair the minimus come out and do a very good repair of the medius also if you have done your minimus and medius repair well you hardly would have a lurch or to kind of work function so the whole idea we use whether anterior or posterior posterior lateral anterior lateral direct lateral is what you want an optimized function you want an accelerated recovery and maximize survivorship if you are doing all these three parameter use whatever works well in your hands you will have a good functional result so remember all roads lead to room everybody has to choose its own so suit what works well in your hands if you are doing revisions you have to understand you require more of extensile approaches we saw a lot of in, uh, videos in uh, in my last stuff and i'll discuss in detail on the femoral canal preparation trips and tricks now the principles of thr reconstruction what do we want a we want to restore the center of rotation b we want to restore the vertical and the medial offset as were told in preoperative templating and we want to restore the combined antiversion you are doing all these parameters by any approach by any implant it really doesn't make a difference your hip is going to last multiple decades you restore center of rotation restore medial offset restore vertical offset equalize the limb length you are done with your surgery so templating whether you do these kind of templates manual ones you do it on the monitors or like i showed you on the auto hip templating system which are like mechanized systems that move through what you have to see is you want to restore your leg length you want to restore your offset you have different kind of canals a b and c the dots criteria and you have to have stems that fit well for a type c canal uh, never try to fit in for an uncemented one you will have higher amount of failures that's the place where cemented stems are required 
as i told you multiple times this bunch of bone is very very important to be removed because if you don't remove that you will malposition your components either in the coronal or the sagittal plane as you see in the pictures out here if you don't take out this bone your femoral components would not be properly aligned into the ap plane also so this is the vertical restoration so this preoperative calculation is from the lesser trochanter to the center of the femoral head you have to see what is your length what you want to lengthen up so all these things are intraoperative check marks this is the medial offset from the trochanter to the center of the head so what is my medial offset what is my vertical offset these two things are very important to be taken in so with a bone to be removed from there you require a box chisel depending on what kind of approaches you are doing in you need a starter reamer the trochanteric overhang the mark portion is taken off you can use the combination reamer with a blunt canal you identify your femoral canal compaction broaches that are required sequentially increasing the, you reach where your broach becomes stable and fit depending on whether you use a cemented or an uncemented that's what you have to have a space for the cement mantle once your broach is stable and fit in direction of neutral axis you would stop there you can use a calcar planer to have a smooth interface and your proper seating of your stems this is the leveled neck cut so you have different kind of trials you have a standard trial you have a lateralized stem or a high offset trial where you require that you need to restore the medial offset without increasing the length of the limb you require a high offset trial so this is a coplanar test very important taught to us pretty well by chitranavat so coplanar test you do it for combined antiversion what we need to restore is an average 35 degrees of combined antiversion of the femur as well as stabulum so you check that in 1990 position and you see that your head is directly inside the acetabulum totally covered up and you are ranging somewhere between the 30 40 degrees as a range for a combined antiversion for people where you realize that you have uh, you don't have much sort of maneuverability into your femoral component because you are using a monolithic femoral component you can change your version into the stabulum to make sure you have a good combined antiversion you remove the unstable cancellous bone canal diameter is assessed for the kind of centralizer you would use in so restrictor has to move in for a cemented components 2 cm distal to the tip of the stem dry the femoral canal after pulsatile lavage this is a dried femoral cancellous surface cement done with latex pressurization this will take more in the next talk which is on cementation the cement is delivered you have a dry cancellous area the cement is pressurized by this latex or silicon pressurizer pressurized cement put in and then you put in your pre coated femoral component femoral seating as i told you multiple times you need to check on what kind of neck you have used in normal or a high offset it's very very important that if you having a dislocation you need to increase the medial offset if you use a larger head size you will cause lengthening so in order to compensate for that and have a better biomechanics restoration of abductor lever arm you need a high offset stem perforative evaluation of limb length you saw me using in these uh, videos steenven pin it can be used uh, which is the pin in the cotyledon fossa Uh, pin in the femur you saw me using a coaxial stitch parameter for all these parameters that you use through remember one parameter your retraction with a chanli has to be constant your position of the limb as the amount of flexion that you have in has to be constant if you keep moving your position your limb length markers will dissipate so this is where you put up the pin into the infra cotyledon fossa you saw me marking into the live surgery video where it is on what is the kind of lengthening you need to require through so coaxial stitch method is another method that we use through that you saw me using a thread and a definitive marker that you use uh, sort of before head resection and to see if you are restoring the limb length as a lengthening or a shortening or equalization so this is very important again the position and flexion and extension has to be kept in mind as well as where your high offset is required so in order to balance the hip you need to restore the limb length you need to make sure you are not impinging anywhere across put your finger and side and see you are not you are not impinging on any osteophytes that need to be taken off you are not impinging that your acetabular walls are hitting a gone and also you need to check on to the combined antiversion so all these tests that we saw us using the dropic stitch in which in the hip extension the knee should remain flexed if the knee is getting extended that means your hip is very very tight you need to shorten the neck the range of motion 
if you have a lack of extension that means you have a length problem if you have a lack of external rotation that means you have an offset problem the push pull test is the shock test extension or a flexion shock and always check it is a pre dislocation shock also so remember in a total hip arthroplasty you know it's like a cigar if it goes out you can light it again but it never tastes quite the same so be very very particular and cautious in your first surgery you put it right you can always go back and doing a redo surgery but never like the results of a primary surgery so do it well and with this we move on to the last session across which is the cementation i am going to talk a bit on the cementation because it is the gold standard majority of centers in north india because of financial constraints still follow cemented as the uh, workhorse so i'll tell you all technical tips for cementing i remember the time when i was in us uh, no even the registrars never knew how to do a cemented hip because what they do is totally uncemented so the art of cementing cannot start without mentioning the name about sir john chanley the man and the hip uh, who invented uh, low friction arthroplasty and the acrylic bone cement that has lasted decades for us so bone cement is a grout not a glue it fixes by micro interlock fixation achieved by penetration into bone surface and then it subsequently hardens we all feel cemented hips work pretty well but this observation study majority of cemented hip stems are not well cemented what you do wrong thin cement mantle you can have a cracks in the cement you can have voids or air vacuum in the cement you can have a blood out there debonded cement stem bone disconnect soft tissue inside so cemented has also a lot of details to look into when we talk about bone cement be any company you use through it has a liquid which is a methyl methacrylate and as a powder which is a polymethyl methacrylate the liquid has accelerator and stabilizers the powder has initiators it definitely has radio opaque agents like barium sulfate if you use talacos which is the green it has chlorophyll i use more of talacos because as a revision surgeon it becomes very easy for me to see where the cement is there and i have to take it out but needless to say it is your particular choice you can use antibiotics in the cement we will discuss but whenever you use antibiotics heat stable antibiotics to be mixed into the powder all of us whatever I keep saying majority of people follow still the first generation cement mixing in the bowl finger packing of the cement it gives you a hip replacement but you have a irregular incomplete cement mantle please try to step up from the first generation second generation is still okay in the rs systems where you have a distal plug you clean and lavage the femoral canal and retrograde insertion by gun it gives you pressurization and better cement mantles i would say that this is the basic minimum that has to be followed for any uh, cemented hip replacement ideal is a third generation system in which you use all steps of second generation but use the cement with the vacuum mixing because you want to decrease the air into the cement you want to use proximal and distal pressurizations for the femur as well as the acetabulum you want to have specialized coatings the end point is you want to have the best cement quality and better cement mantles so the gold standard today is vacuum mixing of cement use a distal plug retrograde filling from the distal to the proximal with a cement gun jet lavage pressurized system vacuum mixing reduces the porosity of your bone cement so the modern cementing technique i would advocate each one of the listeners to follow through is vacuum mixing with centrifugation thorough bone preparation bone bed with pulsatile lavage put up the distal plug into the canal you don't want your cement to be free flowing up to the knee joint proximal femoral cement pressurization acetabular centralizations and cement spacers into this so the basic cementing decisions are whether i use a plain cement or i use an antibiotic loaded cement there are different philosophies for this but it's a whole together part whether i want a high viscosity or a low viscosity when you're using a cement gun you need to have a low viscosity cement you want to use a hand mix or a vacuum mix you want to use a manual or a syringe application but whatever it is follow the steps of modern cementing techniques be very particular to what kind of ot temperature you have whatever formula you say mixing time and all depends on the ot temperature have it constant your stirring has to be one stir per second don't keep stirring like a dough you have to be very particular how much to mix on because too much mixing would weaken the cement and never hammer the implant while the cement is setting in because it will break up the cement mantles avoid inclusion of air avoid blood lamination foldings and hammering of the processes weakens the cement Uh, tell your anesthetist to you give you hypotensive anesthesia because you want the least amount of blood in the canal while you are cementing temperature would 
do part is any amount of charts you want to follow through as a preparation working and field setting times so be particular on the temperature parameters if the ot's are very hot the cement would set on very fast in a ideal temp part of it you have the low and the high viscosity cement and you have different kind of working application times so your working application times are comparatively very high for a low viscosity cement so you would do a temporary operative templating to see what is the migration what is a shortening you have in an acetabular cementing system do a circumferential exposure i showed you 360 degree exposure of the acetabulum by whatever approach you use through multiple anchor holes pulsatile lavage pressurization and containment so circumferential exposure 360 degree exposure of the acetabulum is required take off any osteophytes that you have for a cemented cup you need to see the bone punctate bleed into subcontral zone so keep reaming till the time you get this kind of a punctate bleeding that's where it will hold on in a lot of ankylosing hips people just put in cemented cups which loosen very very easily because the punctate bleeding was not there it was not a safe zone put up multiple anchor holes you can use multiple holes but i prefer to use a lower pitcher where in the superior quadrant we put in three holes with a self contained drill 8 mm holes like this what is the timing to reduce cement when the cement stops sticking to your gloves when there is a slight wrinkling of cement when it is in a doughy stage so all these things are practical tips to understand what is the stage for putting in the cement you have to use these kind of acetabular pressurizations so this is cement pressurization a silicon stuff once you put in the cement you pressurize the cement inside so that you have a very good bond at this stage just don't put in the cup remember this you do not want a bottom out of the cup so raise into the fovea in the base then put in the cup you can use any kind of cup you want to use through the flange cup or the neutral or the long posterior wall and this kind of cement plugs that you want to go through you have different kind of holders but remember whenever you are putting in your cup you have to be very particular on the inclination and the version your pelvis position has to be very very fixed you have to see preoperatively whether you are working on any sort of situation where you have a lum huge lumbar lordosis or you are working on a fused operated spine because all these cases you need to understand you need to change the cup version otherwise like in a fused spine you put up the hip into the normal anti version that you put through you will dislocate your hips so acetabular version is very very important to see you need to see the spine x ray very very important in any thr to work on to the lateral x ray of the spine to decide where you need to deviate from your anti version without confusing you further i will just tell two important tips because i don't want to confuse you if you have a fused spine or a flat back you need to decrease the anti version if you have a patient with a huge amount of a lumbar lordosis you increase the anti version remember this anti version has to be dictated with the spine position spine and pelvis are a composite similarly where you position your hip if you position your hip very very high from the tear drop you will have a limb shortening and lengthening and laxity of the abductors if you use a very low position that means you go beneath the tear drop you will again cause limb lengthening whatever you say as a chanli told you you need to medialize your acetabulum because you need to have a better hip biomechanics you want to have a better offset control so medialize your cups use the right kind of offset on the femur your placement has to be optimal what we follow is a lunic safe zone of 30 to 40 degrees 45 degrees of uh, abduction and 15 to 20 degrees of inclination uh, sort of anti version so as i told you you want to have a white out of cement all throughout you don't want a bottom of out of cement so right stage right size and the right way to position is extremely important you want to have the best cement control in all three safe groin zones for our femoral cementing first thing is vacuum mixing this is how our vacuum mixing is done so you use a vacuum mixer this is the palacos cement that i'm going to use through you put in the liquid in a palacos you put the liquid first and then powder to the liquid which is a reverse from what you find in other depu and uh, striker cements that you normally get throughout here once you put through so you are pushing in this is where your suction is going to take out all the air the vacuum mixer is taken off you put this and then you attach this composite to your cement gun rotate it through and you have a cement coming out see it is not sticking to your gloves that's the stage to enter in so this is the preparation of the canal you have used a distal plug use this femoral brush to take out loose cancellous bone inside the canal so once the loose cancellous bone is taken out then you use a pressurization the bone lip pulsatile lavage 
you should have a dry cancellous area after this. So you see all blood is taken out. You have distal plug, then retrograde filling of cement. Distal plug is put in. This is the blue structure you see is the latex pressurization. You can use this. And what you use is the kind of feeding tube that you see on the left. So as you keep pushing, the blood keeps coming out. This is what we need to prevent any cement syndrome. So this is where your cement is well compacted inside the canal. This is where your feeding tube is taken out. Then you have a canal lying in, in front of you. That's a stage in which you put in your cement stem at the right kind of position, lateralized with the right kind of antiversion that you have preoperatively planned and take out the cement from the side. This is where you have your impacted femoral component. So you saw these brushes being used, the vacuum mixer being used, the cement gun being used, distal plug being used, and proximal sealants being used. So as I told you, the distal plug is two centimeter distal to the tip of the stem, uses pulsatile lavage because you want, you want to have is a clear, open, porous bone. We want this kind of femoral cancellous surface area before cementation, cement gun with latex pressurization. You compact the canal, the cement is delivered, pressurized cement, and you pre-coat your stem and impact it through at the kind of seating level that you decided intraoperatively and preoperatively. These are the pressure changes that occur across into the canal. So the surgeon faces three variables. What is the size of the canal? What is the kind of cement you're using in? What is the size of the stem? But surgeon himself is the greatest variable because you need to control your parameters, how you're going to use cement in type A, B, or C canal. Cemented stems are the stems for all femoral geometries. And remember that you have different kinds of design considerations that you need to have because the cement mantle you require is three to four millimeters. You require around two centimeters or two millimeters between the metal and the bone. And you need around 1.5 to 2 millimeters going inside the bone for a very good cemented component that is going to last two to three decades. You don't want a distal loading. You don't want a fracture of cement mantle. And you require a total whiteout of cement in all groin zones. So you, the type A and B canals would show you a typical whiteout that you see like this, equally very good. Bone cement implantation syndrome is a sudden fall of BP just after implantation. So you always tell your anesthetic at that stage that I'm about to cement. The anesthetics will hydrate the patient pretty well. Remember that you need to do a lavage, as I told you, you need to vent out all the blood that is coming on with the feeding tubes that we are putting in. You need to do a retrograde filling and distal plug. But remember this bone cement implantation can, syndrome can occur even with uncemented, when you do not use the cement. So it's one of the feature, you have different kind of bone cement that you see through. You can use antibiotic loaded cement in every case or in cases where you have a potential or revisions. Whenever you use antibiotic, use heat, labile heat stable antibiotics. You can have pre-mix antibiotics like gentamicin, tovermicin, or you can add Vanco to your cements. Uh, newer next edition bone cements contain hydroxypatite, tricalcium phosphate, inorganic bone, sodium fluoride, but these are not currently in vogue. So cemented THR, is the technique reproducible even in today's time? Yes, technique is demanded, but one must master it and it is possible to reproduce in 95% of your patients provided. Cemented hip is not a cheap hip. So you follow your steps pretty well. Do not cheap, do a manual mixing and do a finger impaction. That would impact your results. So with this, uh, I think it's a vast topic. I'm more than happy to take out any questions that uh, my co-colleagues as well as audience has right now. We'll, we'll discuss after one lecture, but thank you very much, Dr. Vadva. I think that was a wonderful presentation. And thanks for chipping in at the last time, uh, minute, uh, because obviously Dr. Avtar Singh could not come. So wonderful presentation. Over to Dr. Chandra for next talk, how to get it right for the first time. Yeah, good evening. Uh, can you see my Yeah, go screen? to screen. The slide share, uh, yeah, yeah, full screen, yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, so a oh, fantastic uh, uh, arrangement and thank you Dani, for this opportunity. Uh, it was an excellent presentation or demonstration uh, by Dr. Manoj Vadwa. Uh, I have my task very clear. So he delivered a grace anatomy and uh, my job is to reduce it to Chaurasya and uh, give, you, give you all a, a kind of executive summary of uh, you know, how to do a, a 
uh, hip replacement and getting it right first time. I would like to start with a story. This guy came to my clinic and he said, sir, do you remember me? Uh, I said, yeah, vaguely I remember you, like we tell to all patients. And he said, four years back, I came here for a surgery. And he came and sat like that. So I was wondering, I thought I have done a knee replacement for him. And then I discovered that uh, he had a hip replacement. And this is how his hip was when he came. So, and this is how he was walking. And he said, sir, I can do more. I want to show you. So, okay, what can you do more? And then he started his acrobatics. See what I can do. See what I can do. And this is the operated hip. And uh, yeah, my heart started thumping when I was watching all this, uh, you know, him doing. But anyway, he has been doing all these things, so I did not stop him. So when I when you see all this, and that's when you got it right. So I pulled out his X-ray because he had not come after four years, and probably he came for a, a stitch removal, and he had never come after that. So how do we get it right the first time? I think Dr. Wadhwa has taken, through, taken all of us through the fantastic techniques. And I realize that he is also uh, Dr. Ranawat's disciple, like uh, I follow most of the steps like what he showed. So what do we get it right? So we need to get the anatomy right. We need to get the implant choice right. We need to get the fixation right. So. And then most importantly, we need to get the patient right to match all the above. So if you look at the um, hip, and this is Dr. Nawat's slide, and you need to get all these things right. And they look very simple, but if you need to be uh, getting it right every time and the first time, you need practice like uh, Dr. Wadwa showed. Get the center of rotation, get the offset right, get the vertical height right, and get the combined antiversion right. So this is a picture that Ranawat used to show where you check the coplanar coplanarity. So we, we were always told about the getting the antiversion right, uh, but actually the right thing is to get the coplanarity li right with using this uh, coplanar test with the limb in about 30 to 45 degrees of interlotation, look at uh, the head and the uh, cup, and uh, both of them should be coplanar like it is showed in the um, picture. So it's very, very important uh, that we get the implant right. You know, the right implant is what is good in your hand, whatever it is uh, in the rest of the world, but whatever you are used to, whatever I know that is, um, you know, uh, tested and tried. Uh, 12 years back, I used to feel bad that I was not doing resurfacing, metal on metal resurfacing. But, you know, three, four years uh, down the line, I realized that it's best that I didn't start. And my, my patients do not have to worry and every day about what's going to happen to my hip, what's going to happen to my hip. A perfect implant can and should last for 30 years or even more. And if you Majority of the implants which are tested with the track record can give you this result uh, today. And the, um, the bearing choice, uh, you, yeah. So we, Dr. Rohit discussed about the bearing choice. Um, younger patients, ceramic and ceramic, and most of the other patients having ceramic on uh, poly, or if elderly patients having a metal on cross-linked poly is a, a reasonably a good choice and for most of them it can be one surgery in their lifetime. Okay, so recently I was watching a video from CCJR where uh, they he was discussing about at-risk implants. Okay, so these are conventional poly which is which was available more than 12 years back and maybe they are selling them till the stocks last even now but please do not use conventional poly. And of course, like uh, in the discussed in the previous uh, presentations, metal on metal articulations are gone. In 2018, they were still 
and about uh, you know 0.1 to 2 percent of the surgeons who are using metal on metal and i don't know what is the statistics today but metal on metal articulations are of the are gone uh, with the wind and also gone are the modular neck designs so i think trininosis and alveol uh, phenomenon are uh, you know uh, a thing which need to be uh, uh, you know considered in the long run and also there are several recall devices and which we should not use them and uh, like uh, dr rohit discussed beware of the newer implants with no or uh, any follow up okay then getting the fixation right you saw how uh, dr wadwa demonstrated either cemented or uncemented it may not matter but you need to get it right the fixation you have to get it right and the anatomy right all though the world over i think Uh, about 99% of the surgeons in normal circumstances primary hip they are using uncemented and they are reserving very few people are reserving their cemented things for very very osteoporotic or very very elderly or for cost constraints uh, using the cemented otherwise uh, rest of the world has moved over to uncemented um, implants or fixation but whatever it is if you get it right even a cemented hip can last 40 years i have seen uh, hips uh, operated by the charlie uh, in england uh, with 45 years follow up okay the most important thing you have to get it right is the patient you know look at the comorbidity look at his lifestyle look, look at his socio economic status and consider his attitude if your hip has to last longer you have to get the patient right because patient is the greatest source of variability in your surgery and the factors negatively impacting the longevity of hip replacement is a younger patient higher bmi and very very active lifestyle and also if he has addictions okay so apart from these four things you need to you need to be right as a surgeon you need to get it right so that is only possible by training and training and training get your training right you know and develop professionalism be a patient advocate and follow evidence based medicine and never stop learning and things attending things like this uh, and uh, listening to uh, people will improve your techniques perpetually and the other thing which you you should get right is you are i know team surgery is a team effort you have to get your assistants right you have to get your nurse right you have to get your physio right you have to get your most importantly anesthetist right the success of your arthroplasty practice depends on mostly on your anesthetist and his pain techniques so if you get all these things right and of course you have to implement the uh, uh, protocols right and get your indication right look at this guy who is uh, you know was operated elsewhere uh, is having a post polio stl paralysis on the left side and he had a fracture neck femur and someone did a hip replacement it got dislocated And, uh, and the uncemented hip has been converted to a cemented hip and still it dislocated and you are in a soup uh, to correct all these things when you go in again of course you you are with the modern techniques and the implants you will be able to get it right but it is a uh, herculean task and uh, if you have to get your protocols right just write it down and everybody talks the same a uh, language whether it is weight bearing mobilization uh, i know with, oh, using a cane or using a stick or walker for everything you have to uh, you know write it down and for every patient they follow the same protocol and if there is any change in the protocol you should everybody in the team including the physios should be you know talking the same it's very very important that you get it right so when you get it right hip replacement can and should and will last for more than 30 years in more, more than 90% of the patients 
It is one of the best operation in relieving pain and restoring function. So thank you very much. Any questions? I'll be happy to answer any questions. We will, we will go with the for question now. Can you stop your, your screen sharing? Thank yeah. You. Yeah. So I think we can take uh, questions and have comments. Dr. Yadav, Dr. C.S. Yadav, can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I will, my question is uh, for Dr. Manoj. Yes, As sir. Dr. Manoj told me he is trained by Ranavat. And <laughs> Ranavat says this has been taught to our country. It is better to release the gluteus maximus to avoid sciatic nerve injury. Why it is so, but I do. I also do not really. I agree with you, but uh, just explain that. So the question is, as uh, I think we started from this, when you keep doing a technique beyond a certain level, you know what you are handling up. What Dr. Ranamath used to teach to everybody was for an average surgeon, it doesn't operate a very high volume. You do not want to enter a situation where you cannot retract the femur anteriorly, or you will have chances of shedding the. On that account, I agree. I release whenever it is required to retract fever entirely. Otherwise, never ever for the fear of sciatic nerve. In my case, like you. So like you, I, we would always feel for the sciatic nerve by the finger if it is in plane. Uh, so the question today is moving on to an early mobilization across protocols. But as far as possible, like we're directly approaching, we're reaching on to a parameter, how we can have things where we do not release the muscles or cut the muscles at all, cause the least amount of morbidity, have the fastest amount of recovery, and what is not required to be released, please try to prevent it. While at the same outset, in a lot of revision cases or in stiff hips or ankylosed hips, we do release also. We realize that we cannot translate the femur entirely, but that is maybe one out of uh, 100 kind of a situation. That is true in every case, whenever you feel like. So that is clear. Another question, how much percentage of total hip uh, you do by anterior approach? Uh, sir, very selective. But That's what is the carrier because, message. Uh, I think you are the posterior approach surgeon and you like it. And I, I love posterior approach. Uh, sir, uh, <laughs> when you operate a high volume, we keep on experimenting new things, what works in your hand. My workhorse is still the posterior approach because anterior approach has a high amount of a steep learning curve. It is not an approach that I would use for my rheumatoids or for my fractured neck femurs or for protrusio kind of hips. So it is a selective parameter, but for all young active population or where I have to do a single sitting bilateral total hip replacement, I would easily move on to uh, putting the patient supine and doing both hips simultaneously. Otherwise, for all those geriatric populations or fractured neck femurs or protrusios or ankylosed or stiff hips, I don't think so the DA is one of choice for them. So do you, do you get that low viscosity pella cause for the hip? Because what I get, I always do total knee with the medium viscosity pella because I yes, like it. Same. It is fantastic. Previously, I was using simplex. But in the uh, for the hip, do you use medium, same medium viscosity or low? Same, sir, same. Uh, so the question is, for simplex, we had terrible times wasting the amount of time we require for uh, doing a surgery. The same amount yeah. we used to wait for the cement to dry off. Then... Uh, with a lot of surgeons, we used to put it in heated environment also. But getting off it with a pelicose, but the timing has to be absolute. You need to have a very good teamwork. Uh, so the carry on message is, if you are not having a very optimal team, if you are not operating in OTs where your OT temperature is very well regulated and controlled, where you do not have the guns and parameters, I think safer off to use a medium or a low viscosity cement. Once you have mastered the technique, once you know that I have a controlled OR temperature, you have a very well-trained team. So that's a stage where you can use a medium viscosity cement for implanting your femurs also. Great. Great. Any other question, please? Uh, sir, Dr. Wadwa, yeah. when you are uh, implanting the cup, what is your landmark? Uh, million dollar question. Yeah. So... For all these uh, hips which are not very smoothly damaged, I think my tail gives me the best orientation. Because whatsoever we say, positioning as per the orientation with the landmark jigs going vertical and parallel to yeah. the floor, all those things here are just ideas. My yeah, basic I saw, case I saw is, you. I saw you using those jigs. That's why I put that question. So, I, think, yeah. I think most of us depend on an anatomical landmark rather than yes. jigs. 
so i use those jigs but i do not totally like i would say i still in a knee use yeah. the posterior condylar access but that's just one of the reference yeah. right yeah. so similar way i definitely put in those uh, jigs for whatever advantage they give me but my clinical functional orientation where i want to put up my cup is extremely important so equally yeah. at other stages like i was talking to rohit uh, ramani across on ceramic on ceramics if supposing i'm using a ceramic uh, liner into this i would put my hip a bit 5 degree more closed right mm-hmm. so there my landmarks would i would say i would function more on the functional positions but my biggest landmark is tal transverse tibial ligament is my biggest landmark where i would position up and i would also see where are the osteophytes normally you reference off with the posterior wall because anterior osteophytes would misguide you mm-hmm. so you have to keep all these parameters in mind relying totally on the company based jigs is i think one of the biggest pulling factor is the carry over message absolutely yeah. Uh, I also Dr. want Madhwa, just a I also question. want Dr. Chandra to give the message though he has done extremely well to start with like the case you have shown beautiful yeah. technique but not to encourage for the youngster uh, people who are listening here not to encourage the patient to do those kind of activities because that's not something which is we are expecting absolutely yeah. uh, so that is why uh, the disclaimer is I do not advise all my patients to do whatever absolutely. he did Yeah. i never asked him he never asked me whether i can do so he is just coming and you so know when he started doing all those things my heart was thumping actually absolutely so uh, so the message should be generally we do not ask patients to sit on the floor or or you know squat in the indian toilet uh, in a hip replacement in a knee replacement i ask them to sit on the floor no problem but in a hip replacement we do not but i think You know, eighty percent of these guys who go back, they do not follow our instructions, and they will do oh, whatever yeah. they want. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any Dr. other one? Comment? Just a quick question. Uh, you, as uh, Dr. Yadav also said, you are a posterior. Yeah. Uh, you're doing anterior approach mainly for because you got bored of it and you wanted to try, <laughs> or uh, yeah, are you going to want to try new? I think that is the only reason. Yeah. <laughs> So, Rohit, very nicely said. I wanted to see it was one of the fastest going approach in the Western world. I wanted to put my hands on and uh, do a couple of those anterior, direct anterior approaches. We did, did that, but then we realized the kind of deformities and the kind of stage at which people come to us is very, very different. We have our femurs, which are very, very osteoporotic. So, the moment you put a bipronged and try to lift the femur, you would have those chipping fractures. So that's why today I would say you have to play smart. You have an approach. but it's not necessary you have to apply to every patient across you choose your selections well in heavy muscular patients i would not do a direct anterior approach it really gives you a trouble some in all those patients who are extremely obese onto the pelvis sort of mobilizing the femur is extremely tough so i would select my cases pretty well for all revisions i would never do a direct anterior approach i would move back over there so it has its own deal of advantages when i talk about the newer approaches minimally invasive approaches for a select subgroup of patients Absolutely. And have you used the piriformis sparing approach, uh, superpass? Uh, did that? Never got fascinated with it. I mean, you hardly see structures inside here. Yeah. It's very yeah. you cause a lot of mobility on the soft tissues. Yeah, I mean, very difficult. It is not possible in India to uh, use piriformis sparing. Mm-hmm. Indian patient very rigid and deformed. Yeah. I think what all of us on the panel, I mean, sitting out here, uh, would really endorse is the kind of patients. Rohit, you have guys are you and Dr. Gani are now recently in UK. You would also admit that the kind of patients you get in India, visa vis the kind of hips you get in the Western world, are very very different. So, absolutely, absolutely. I think, so I think with we... these with these comments, we wind up this session and we will move on to the next session. Now I invite uh, the uh, Dr. Naveen Thakur. to start his sharing his screen and start presentation okay thank you, thank you. dr gani thank you doctor so uh, i think i think uh, many things are covered up dr navin yes i have tried to modify Aap something kya yes, le ladak hai kya ye jheel kaun si dikh rahi hai le ladak aisa hi lag raha hai aisa hi lag raha hai sir lag raha hai bahut badhiya lag raha hai aapke piche So, Dr. Navin Thakur is going to be speaking on how to read a post X-ray. Actually, we need to know how to read X-ray because unless until we know, we will not be able to assess ourselves. 
so that is yes, the yes, yes. Part but the, the fantastic talk by dr manoj and others and the previous speakers have covered some of the part of so i have tried to modify it in between my powerpoint let us see how i can deliver it right Thank so you. is it okay this x ray mm -hmm. non square x ray post op this is not okay that is the message i want to give that we must take a good x ray right x ray then and then we can talk on that x ray that what are the parameters that are right for the total hip replacement has been done rightly or not so there are some prerequisites for the post op x ray just like a pre op x ray the post op x ray should mimic the pre op planning x ray and that should be the norm and the protocol that all the measures measurements taken for the pre op planning the same way protocol the post op x rays has to be taken so the ideal thr post op x rays should be always the low pelvic pelvic view both hips together and centered at the pubis and should so the upper one third of femur on the both side and it should be a full length of the prosthesis should be seen 20 degree of internal rotation we'll see the one by one the tube to table distance should be 100 cm or 40 inch and the grid cassette approximately 2 inch below the table so here we can see that it is a well centered x ray the centering is done perfectly where you can see all the parallel lines of anterior superior spine inferior level of spine base of the tear uh, drop ischial tuberosity so in coronal plane in pelvic tilt it is a correct x ray again well centered x ray in the transverse plane that is with a uh, pelvic rotation where you can see the center of this line is going to the symphysis pubis and you can see equal these uh, openings in, on the both the sides and if you see this x ray again it is not centralized so there these has to be uh, uh, taken care of that x ray has to be taken care of and there are three questions by the technician what should be the magnification what view you want and what rotation and why the post operative x ray should be done in the same way as pre operative magnification so you can compare it there should be equal magnification a metal bowl of a non size rounded or a tube or a coin or one rupee coin or similar coin nowadays digital methods are used on x ray there is a one of the marker where you can use a cylindrical rod about 100 mm 10 cm so you can measure it that on a digital that uh, your software and you can compare it and your beams height of the tube should be again 100 cm and you can see here the coin is used as a as a marker for a magnification so height of the tube everything we have discussed why 20% it gives a 20% magnification which is the routine in all commercial templates in built 20% magnification is and magnification and the distance between the pelvis and the film is correlated in the obese patients you get the increased magnification in a thin patients you get the lesser magnification thus magnification is many times subjective and it should be done in the same machine with the same uh, things this is the method how you take a pelvis with both hips ap where the centering is done at the symphysis and the both fit in 20 degree of internal rotation and no single x ray of one hip it is no totally no and it should be bilateral uh, pelvis with both hips only to compare it and you can compare very well and you can see that what is the prominence of the lesser trochanter to know the rotation why it is important because to exactly measure the length of the offset if it is in internal rotation you get exact offset in a neutral it is reduced in external rotation it is reduced so the position of your hip is very much important to measure your offset and to know its functioning or longevity to try to know the longevity do you need a, a cross table lateral yes you need a cross table lateral but not taken routinely immediate post op it is taken in the second follow up when the patient is comfortable to take the uh, different views and it has to be taken like this with a bump here 
pillow at the pelvis to make the pelvis up and take a cross table making the other limb away from the uh, field and yes this is required for a new uh, method of uh, taking different joints of cementing in the both the planes and you have to take both the views to see the cementing joints when the cementing is done in the ap and lateral of the all 14 joints and also whenever you feel that intraoperative there is a chances of a small crack or you may have to take a lateral or a oblique to delineate whether there is a crack inside or not to take a further action immediately so whenever you feel that you i need a lateral x ray always take a lateral x ray so let us once we get an ideal post of x ray you should know how to interpret and to interpret you have to draw certain lines which are already said uh, some of the lines and some of the things are already taken care of let us see first decide this your tear drop and and you decide your this center and draw a inter tear drop line have at a lesser trochanter level these are the another line to uh, have a limb length discrepancy have a intramedullary your uh, your line axis of the femur and have a line perpendicular to this uh, line so these are the lines we uh, regularly want to know about the offset inclination these are the lines you should be familiar with and also the iliohistial line uh, and that is the sentinel's line here you should be familiar with and you must mark this lines to know exactly this is the basics what are the things we need to see in this stable component position inclination antiversion femoral component position fit limb length offset and the cementing joints in the cementing total hips and this has to be in the serial x ray in the post op so in a follow up so that you can see compare that x ray with the follow up if anything happens or any red flags appear in the x ray you can compare it and can see what are the complications are going on or what is happening with that hip with the longevity so one has to have a checklist initial radiograph overview step by step approach anteroposterior and lateral view and these are the parameters 10 which i already said it has to be taken care of in a residency or in a program itself in a protocol that these are the three of uh, 10 check marks minimum that has to be uh, taken care of let us see ideal stable component placement size almost as a template which is done in pre op medial end is 5 to 7 mm from the tear drop center of rotation same as other side medial wall touching the iliohistial line superior margin on the line of the superior margin of opposite acetabulum and one has to take care of inclination depth and the height of this acetabular cup and that is very well said very well in intraoperative findings by dr manoj and there is a safe john that is very well described that the cup inclination of 40 plus minus 10 and antiversion 15 minus 10 and this is the safe john to prevent the dislocation rate and if you are out of the safe john the 6.1% is the dislocation rate has been told you must know the acetabular markings base of the tear drops coccus line that is the iliohistial line and the suprarotator margin here at the acetabulum to know exactly your cup position how to calculate the acetabular inclination let us see how we can calculate this is the inter tear drop line and then you draw a line through the line of that acetabular floor uh, that uh, uh, processes and you come to know that this is the angle of inclination another example where bilateral has been done one side you can see that it is 36 and another side is 45 another example how to uh, take inter drop when the opposite side is also affected and you cannot make square ones but the inter tear drop line is a constant line and you can uh, draw this like how to calculate the antiversion again you need a cross table exact x ray cross table a vertical line is drawn a line on the face of the acetabulum is is drawn here and the angle between them is the antiversion there is a one of the method many methods are there how to calculate the center of rotation that is very important in post operative marking the x ray
so you know these lines now you make a point somebody has described uh, uh, in a sort this is the method of uh, ranamath method of uh, triangular uh, triangulation and here as you see here i am marking here this one point then a per perpendicular line is drawn to the highest point of the uh, this crest and that is 20% uh, is to be taken as a uh, pelvic height and you may make a point at 20% from a point a and that segment has to be then again aligned from point b perpendicular this line is to be drawn and you mark the point c now i am marking the point c you can see now i have started marking the point c and this is the 20% of the pelvic height that had been, that has been calculated now ab is equal to bc it should be equal length and then join the a with c and that is a complete triangle of the same length equal uh, length uh, limbs of the triangle and then the midpoint of that a c line is the center of rotation and that is very much important to know exactly why it is important if the center of rotation of the prosthetic head lies medial to that of cup it produces the increased offset if the center of rotation of the prosthetic head lies lateral to that of the cup it produces the de decrease offset let us see what about the femoral component position you can see here it is in the varus it is in the valgus when it is touch, touching the tip is touching at the medial side and this is in the neutral in the center when there is a subtle change in the varus these lines are very much important you have to draw the lines then and then you come to know there is a slightest slightest varus is there and varus is a known uh, prognostic factor sometimes for a loosening femoral component fit is also you can judge in a post of x ray in a neutral rotation that is a here you can see one example of loose one here it is a tight one and here it is a perfect one ideal one so limb length discrepancy is also to be seen on this and again the same linings are drawn let us see how it is done and this is very much important as uh, uh, shown by Dr. Padda and, and Dr. Gani that the limb length and offset are very much important for hip bar mechanics. And how to calculate this? Again, intertier drop line and at the level of lesser trochanter and see the distance here in between and you can get the limb length discrepancy. It is very important to have a limb length discrepancy because it is the main cause of the dissat dissatisfaction and litigation. And there is a one good paper by Professor Ranawat himself of the pants are too short, the leg are too long. So it is very well described. The femoral offset is also to be drawn like this on a uh, X-ray, as you have done in the pre-op X-ray. Decrease offset has a problem. Increase offset has also a problem. It is very well described by Dr. Manuj Vadva to have a balance of the abductor. The offset can be adjusted of the combined offset, that is the acetabular offset and femoral offset and total offset. Acetabular offset is the distance between the center of rotation and the line abutting the medial wall of the acetabulum. And the femoral offset is the distance between the center of rotation of the vertical line of the center of the femoral canal. To measure the offset properly, the X-ray should be in the 20 degree. Again, that is to be re-emphasized. How to calculate the total offset? Make a point here, have a lines again, and you have a line. You can measure this offset of the femur, then offset of the stabulum, and you can have a combined offset like this in a normal side, and you can compare whether you what you have done. Higher offset than the native hip causes the lot of abductor muscle tension, early wear and patient dissatisfaction, lower offset than the native beneficial in the mild cases but can cause a limp to the patient again the cementing john dr marud Vadwa has perfectly shown the cementing technique for acetabulum charlie has a graded three joints and for the uh, uh, femur there are grun joints and further 
uh, there ha that has been uh, 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 classified into a lateral view by another seven Johns. So these has to be taken care in both the planes. Again, I am mentioning, and you can see here the acetabular cement Johns are perfectly taken care of in all three Johns, and that gives you a, a predictability of longevity. This is a paper from Ranamat where the state of the bone cement interface postoperatively in the radiograph is a predictor of longevity of the cemented socket and it has a high degree of probability. At the same time, you must check for the interdigitation with the holes. You can see the fall off of this 15 years of the Chandli and you can see here all white. Fantastic cementing, perfect cementing, no over cementing, no less cementing, exact cement mental. Too much of the cement mantle, again you can measure it here in the x-ray and you can see here, you can delineate very well that the, in the drill holes also there is a digitation and, and a good bonding here, whatever the anchoring holes are made in, in that part. So these can be seen very well in the post-op x-ray and you can be sure that there is a good digitalization and good fixation with the cement. But according to the stem, you must know the different stems require the different cementings. And this has been very well described, the Exeter stem and the Charlie stem. If you see the design, it is a composite beam or a shape, uh, closed shape. While it is a loaded taper is a, uh, another Exeter type. So what is the difference? Difference is here you require cement in John 4. Complete beam or safe close, Charlie stack. While in Exeter, no cement in the zone 4. So you have to be known that which implant has been used and where you have to see the cement zones uh, in the femur. So ideally, 2 to 3 centimeter all around should be the cement. And there are gradings has been described. Every, everybody knows the Barak has already described this grade 1, A, B, C, again C, C1, C2. And the, uh, why this has been described for loosening. A radiolucency greater than 2 mm at either interface is a sign of loosening. So this has to be taken care of perfectly. So now when you see a post-op x-ray, this is the list which we have described. Let us check our knowledge by examples. Find the problem. What is the problem? Anybody wants to volunteer here? This is the line another line and it is a two vertical cup. Immediately the lines drawn by the resident will come to know. Another example, again the lining, it is a two horizontal cup. Again these linings we are done and same measurements we are done and you can see the high hip center. This hip is at a high hip center. Again you can see here there is a mild shortening is also there with this hip. Again Comment on the cementing. You can see here the cementing, the bone plug is here, here, th that uh, restrictor is here, and the cementing is poor. So, John 1 and John 7, hardly any cement, implant broken because of not enough medial support. No cement pressurization has been used, as Dr. Manoj Vardhwai said, to over uniform cementing, and improper cement restrictor has been used. Cup position, again, you can draw a line, this. And you can see there is a mild medialization that is acceptable. Significant, significant medialization not accepted. Two lateralization. Again, you are changing the offset and this is the ideal one. Ideal non-cemented in all measurements. You can see here all measurements are good and the x-ray is also taken in a right position. So again, in the follow-up, x-ray step-by-step approach of the same to compare it why it is to be compared? Because we must know the red flags for the component failure. These are the red flags, which is very well described in the literature. As you see here, the cementless cup, you can see here, it is a previous X-ray and follow-up. Here you can see the stress shielding perfectly. You can compare only if you have taken an X-ray in a right way. Again, here you can see the stress shielding in the AP view and the lateral view. Again, the stress shielding is here. So, it is your x-ray what you have taken it. Again, you can see here exeter stem and here is the subsidence. And these are the findings, simple x-rays. Simple x-ray will tell you whether this is failing or it is working. Again, 
early femoral loosening you have a x ray perfect x ray but the cementing is not perfect and you see the gradual varus is going on and there is a loosening superlateral lucency in the coral dip stem you can see here very well so you have to see that in a non cementin and cementin there are certain signs here it is very clear cut you can see that cementing is failing and also the cup migration the migration is very easy to pick up so again you have to check for the cementing and you have to check for the wear if you have a center of rotation here in the previous x ray and this this is wandering here then there is a particular sign there is that there is the wear of the your insert uh, uh, liner again you can see the minor change if you do a uh, zooming of it and you can see the distance here and distance here and it shows the uh, liner wear against the spot welding you can pick up with the non cementing and you can see that it has a good fixation and same way in the shaft you can see the spot welding or you can have a pedal uh, this sign where you can see the good bonding has occurred naturally biologically here you have to be familiar with these different stems and different systems the main message again is have a systemic approach to assess the radiograph check list protocol be aware of the diversity of implant compare, compare the radiograph over a time period do not <clears throat> miss the signs of component failure serial identical x rays are required the my question to all the faculty is would it be possible to construct a scoring system based upon the systemic review of the initial immediate post operative x ray would predict the prosthetic survival i must acknowledge there are some inputs are given by pachore sir and yuvraj lakum from the ahmedabad and i am thankful to all thank you very much thanks a lot dr navin for wonderful presentation uh, no you. over to dr chandrashekhar yadav nobody wants to go into that field which is infection especially after arthroplasty but somehow we have to deal with that and he is going to tell us how to deal with this enemy thank you dr yadav you are on mute yeah now it is okay can make you hear it, me i uh, we can hear you but make it full screen sir uh, uh, ah yeah, sure sure powerpoint sure. so yeah yes sir yes sir. Yeah, powerpoint so yeah ha uh, right thank you dr gani after serving 22 years at aims delhi i joined last year in gangaram hospital as a chairman head department of joint replacement and reconstruction and basically in india or developing nation not only the rate is also more but the resistant and dreaded type of infection is also more in developing country and they are worse in every aspect even other complication we have more and basically more over we don't have data like uh, western uh, part so factor responsible for the infection surgeon or and host all three are responsible most of the time there may be combination of all these three and why infection is more in india because of uh, all over the world in most of the country the growth of arthroplasty is around 10% but in india growth is much more like 30% arthroplasty suppose we have done one lakh knee over here this year next year our country will be doing one lakh 30000 like that so in same proportion the decent or training and the paramedics we do not have and even training is defective accountability is not seen in our country and there is a no definitive protocol this photograph is explaining 
there is a no definitive protocol my choice anesthetist saying surgeon is saying my choice then patient say whether to pay hospital bill or not it is my choice so it is like that so uh, infection is the one of the most common cause for the revision and uh, classification is based on the early infection like within 4 weeks or 3 weeks then late infection these early and late infection is because of contamination during the surgery i will cover all these two not like acute hematogenous infection so what i have learned and uh, uh, if we use heparin in the arthroplasty the 3 to 5% fold there is a increase complication like increase infection discharge hematoma local pain more swelling so i do not use heparin and since then our infection rate has gone down significantly because i have stopped using heparin in 2006 7 when i started independent arthroplasty and uh, drain for last more than 5 year i do not use drain even after a stoppage of drain the infection rate has not increased and i use tranexamic acid uh, routinely it is a very good drug so about the antibiotic uh, we when i was working at aims we used to do more than 1100 joints in a year in, that include live demonstration surgery and my leh ladakh surgery as well and now infection rate is uh, basically it is less than one in overall uh, year and i was taught when i was not doing independent arthroplasty i was taught to give antibiotic for two weeks we were giving antibiotic till suture removal dr gani knows that and but now i give antibiotic for 3 to 5 days and i am not like single shot surgeon because what i feel that is my feeling it may not be proven by literature so i feel uh, we do not screen the patient for the infection whole body screening cannot be done and it is very difficult to rule out our patient he uh, to rule out our patient is not harboring infection at distant site so i give for the 5 days and most of the in the body in, uh, in injection i antibiotic is given for the 5 days most of the time it is infection is not very dreaded uh, around 5% gram negative and mrsa and uh, these are the dreaded infection it, more than 80% it is not very dreaded infection so now i will talk about the management of early infection it means post operative within 4 to 6 weeks what we have to do whenever patient have discharge like this do not wait hesitate to open the wound post operatively especially when discharge is continuing more than usual in your patient second when the amount of discharge is increasing successive day then do not hesitate to open third situation when you feel there is a bad appearance or smell from the discharge and this situation you should uh, basically do pressure lavage first pressure lavage or some sort of debridement and it is most effective no. usually i do not put drain but here now i will put the drain and if you do the debridement of pressure lavage what happens it basically what is debridement it is dilution so dilution of bacterial load first this happens another thing is that it increases the blood supply of the local area so it increases the overall antibiotic supply to that area and we can take sample from the deeper aspect so first pressure lavage is very important sometime in less than 10% cases multiple pressure lavage after the surgery before the membrane formation may be required like this was our patient operated in bihar we did total hip arthroplasty this was the post operative discharge it was continuing till 12 days so we did at 12 day first uh, that uh, pressure lavage debridement it doesn't resolve so it uh, after the first lavage it got more aggressive after the second lavage and with the change of antimicrobial agent it healed completely and patient is fine so now question has arise uh, in post operative period when to sacrifice the processes so it is very difficult uh, decision 
uh, you have operated it is very easy to sacrifice processes when patient has been operated by somebody else but for in our patient it is not it is difficult so fortunately in most of that uh, time if you do proper for early lavage first uh, first lavage or even second lavage this is not required and uh, even after the multiple two three debridement there may be two situations discharge may not stop but other symptoms remains like uh, uh, pain swelling then what you have to do uh, you have to put patient on a prolonged antibiotic because prostate is well fixed it is not uh, uh, advisable to, to remove the pro well fixed prostate and second situation may be discharge may not stop but put on patient for the antibiotic suppression in this situation after the multiple lavage and vancomycin if there is a culture sensitivity positive it is a good sign if it is you are getting nothing then uh, vancomycin combination of cephalosporin it is fantastic it covers most of the bacteria even rifampicin is very frequently used a rifampicin also damage the membrane so these antibiotic can be used so sometime what is not a confused as a infection clear discharge superficial skin necrosis sometime positive culture because of contamination this situation it is not a infection and when to sacrifice processes when there is a intractable pain or not a patient is not able to put weight usually second day all patient put weight walk with the help of walker and signs of loosening appears like that here you can see loosening so in this situation you have to decide about the uh, sacrifice of the processes and uh, so uh, what is management of the infection it is not easy to make chronic infections and basically key to success is early diagnosis on the basis of high index of suspicion that is most important and evaluate the patient and implant do physical examination biochemical examination radiological examination culture and microscopic examination so basically corroboration of clinical and investigating finding is very important to arrive a diagnosis on the basis of one or two point you cannot arrive uh, at diagnosis so but at the same time it has to be differentiated from the tubercular infection like tubercular infection they are different from the septic infection this our patient operated for the tb hip later on she developed this uh, sinus after many years four five year we started att joint preserved this is after the healing so because tuberculosis doesn't have any biofilm another patient our tuberculosis same we started second line of att patient has healed so this we have published our work in over the uh, total hip arthroplasty in active stage of tuberculosis and now it is the allegoro rhythm how to deal with the chronic infection so uh, fail dip do esr crp abnormal finding repeat esr crp if there is a increased uh, uh, increase esr crp in serial then it is highly suggestive of infection do aspirate if aspirate is positive highly suggestive of infection and if repeat aspirate is same bacteria and uh, it is positive it is almost diagnostic of infection same bacteria in repeat aspiration and from the radiograph you can easily make out whether it is a septic infection or aseptic infection you can see this is the septic infection you can see periosteal reaction over here and you can see endosteal osteolysis this is not it is ragged damage it is not like a smooth cortex if it is smooth it means it is a Sept aseptic loosening. It is ragged. It is you so easily you can make out there is a infective uh, loosening. ESR CRP they are quite informative, but successive increase of ESR CRP they are more in fact informative. Bone scan. Uh, it is very useful when X-ray looks normal and patient is symptomatic. You can see uh, if bilateral knee has been done uh, or bilateral hip has been done. if uptake is increased on one side it means 
something is wrong and that side that may be because of some activity is going on and most of the time it is because of low grade infection so if it is negative it is more informative but if it is positive most likely it is infection take a multiple culture and uh, go for the sensitivity and no growth is seen in these situation even in the presence of infection like slow grower sometimes culture is required for even for a, a month or few more weeks and faulty bacteriological technique patient is on antibiotic there is always negative culture even in the presence of infection insufficient number of sample and bacteria adherent to the processes uh, this is about the uh, now how to go about the revision uh, once infection is established and you have to remove the processes there are definitely advantage of disadvantage of one stage or two stage i always prefer two stage surgery what is done in stage 1 remove the implant remove all infected and dead tissue assess the host and need assess the whole host bone and tissue and need for the fusion surgery and take multiple samples and go for culture sensitivity and antibiotic spacer is put and sometime even after doing this infection doesn't settle and patient is having a discharge then second attempt of same thing is required multiple uh, that stage of one so uh, some in the infective thr eto is very frequently re uh, required especially in the cemented hip otherwise you cannot remove the infection you can see after the eto we have put long uh, uh, spacer these spacer may be handmade most of the time we use handmade uh, because uh, we can these these handmade can deliver large amount of uh, antibiotic in the ready made there is a, a limited antibiotic and it may be in one piece or two piece depending on the situation this is uh, already ready made so but, but i prefer because it is cheap and we can change uh, handmade according to our choice and dislocations are uh, are common in both the spacer you can say you can see this is our case dislocated spacer our case dislocated spacer and uh, now time for the second implantation after few weeks when joint is quiescent and uh, tissue looks healthy esr crp normal aspirate is negative frozen section is negative go for the uh, second stage of surgery and uh, overall take him message is excellent training of surgeon or staff is needed to avoid the uh, infection decent or or practice is needed early diagnosis and corroboration of clinical finding and two stage revisions are most important in the cases of infection thank you i think i have not overshoot the time thank you gani uh, should i go for the second topic no i think let the dr chandra to come in because otherwise it will be a bit like together so i think dr chandra will deliver the talk and then you take over next talk again thank yeah. you oh, okay there is another thing so we got two dr chandra shekhar uh -huh. so, <laughs> so south indian chandra i am chandra shekhar he i think chandra in <laughs> great great chandra go ahead okay so good evening everybody so uh, sir chandrashekar sir thank you very much for an excellent presentation on infections thank you chandrashekar it, it was really uh, you know for us uh, what you do guys do there is a um, learning for us thank you chandrashekar okay now after heavy talks uh, about the techniques and the complications and how to get it right and all those things uh because this is a primary course i wanted to educate uh, the beginners on some of these behaviors and rituals we follow in the operation theater and also the evidence behind the same joint replacement surgery is a is a fantastic operation that's why we all want to do that why is it not moving ah uh, yeah yeah so for some reason it was not moving 
And so you have to some, click once and on the screen. Then and then it is screen is selected. Then it goes. Yeah. So uh, someone walking like that, you know, is transformed into a, a fantastic normal individual, and that's why we are all excited about doing these surgeries. And we just saw uh, Chandrasekhar sir showing the complication of. Um, infection and how horrible it can be. It's a nightmare both for the patient and the surgeon. So how do we avoid this uh, infection nightmare? So if you look at what is infection, what can cause infection, you need a million staph aureus bugs to cause an infection. But with uh, a prosthesis in place, it drops to 10,000. And in orthoplasty surgeries, even nosocomials from nose and uh, skin with less pathogenicity can become a, an infection bugs. And that is the danger. That's why uh, we are all so afraid of this infection. So what we need an obsessive attention to detail if we have to avoid this infection. So for which uh, people over decades, over centuries have developed a lot of behaviors and rituals. I know we follow like sacred cows. And let's look at uh, some of the evidence available. So. If you, like uh, someone in the faculty suggested, we need uh, 22 degrees or you know, around that temperature uh, in the operation theater, in the orthoplasty operation theater with a humidity of about 40 to 70, 70%. And you see the difference between the no laminar flow and the laminar flow theaters uh, and what happens to the air circulation here in this video. And that is why we are obsessed uh, having, uh, you know, laminar flow theater for orthoplasty surgeries. And all the uh, you know, evidence I'm going to be quoting is from these two papers. Uh, and I, I also want everyone to go through Parvizi and Thorsten Gerke's uh, consensus paper, which I am going to show at the end uh, regarding the uh, uh, preventing uh, prosthetic joint infections is the updated recommendations for control of surgical site infection by J.W. Alexander et al. in the Annals of Surgery from 2011, and also a report from the Hospital Infection Society Working Group updated in uh, 2005. So this uh, uh, Hospital Infection Society wanted to set up a clear and practical guidelines, uh, which are evidence-based to control of infections. And they have come up with recommendations. So category one recommendation means there is a strong evidence, so you should follow it. And category two is there is some evidence good to follow. And category three, there is no evidence, but let's see what we all do about uh, these things. So these rituals are about a patient preparation and what we follow on the operating table and what the departmental and theater staff follow uh, in the operation theater. So coming to patient preparation, so there is category one, that means strong evidence against shaving. Do not shave. If at all you need to remove hair in the operative field, just use a clipper. And uh, so earlier we used to ask patients to take chlorhexidine a shower or bath two, three days before. There is no evidence uh, to support this. However, there is uh, one paper recently which showed a better or a lesser infection rate if they use these, um, you know, echo bath, uh, which are chlorhexidine wipes. They just wipe the area um, a day before when they get admitted to hospital two, three times before surgery. Okay, hand hygiene, coming to hand washing. Uh, back in PG days, we used to be, you know, taught how we should thoroughly scrub and use a, a brush and uh, you know almost peel off your skin um, you know before you go and assist the professors so but now there is a clear ev evidence that uh, more than 2 minute wash is not beneficial so there is no evidence to show that uh, you know you you scrub for uh, 5 minutes and it is going to lessen the infections and uh, nowadays alcoholic hand rubs are uh, more more or less acceptable as alternatives. There is no need for hot water, but warm water is enough. And what about skin preparation? 
there is category two evidence uh, that, that these do help and uh, alcohol solutions, a combination of chlorhexidine and alcohol may be enough, but iodophores like povidone, most of us use uh, are enough for giving you uh, protection against any infection. But there is no well, you know, evidence to suggest either chlorhexidine alcohol is better or povidone iodine is better. But what we need to understand is alcohol-based you know, skin preparation gives immediate effect that you apply it and it kills the germs, but it dries up very quickly. Whereas povidone iodine, so it stays, it needs to be there for longer time to act. So there is no point in applying povidone iodine and immediately using a spirit uh, to remove it. So which majority of the times we used to as uh, postgraduate students. So if you're using povidone, let it be there for some time, then only it can act. But the advantage of chlorhexidine is that it can, it stays, uh, you know, active up to six hours. That is the advantage. And the skin irritation uh, is lesser with chlorhexidine. And however, uh, when uh, the, uh, the general surgical uh, team or gynecologist people use, uh, they can't use alcohol based in the uh, genital area, but they need, they need to use povidone iodine only because it is irritating. Okay, what about adhesive drapes? There is category one evidence that there is no benefit from these adhesive drapes. But do we use it? I think majority of the orthoplasty surgeons use it. So, so what if there is no evidence? But it keeps the surgical uh, area very clean and, and the, the drapes won't move and they won't come out. It just, everything stays in one place and it gives a, a, a good feeling for us. But if you talk about evidence, there is no evidence that these do help reduce uh, infections. And what about uh, uh, gloving? So double gloves, this is not for the patient, but for, for the surgeon, it protects from viral transmissions and from a needle stick injury. So please do use double gloves. There is correct category one evidence regarding the same. And now I come to the face masks and caps. So this the photographs you see, we were using it 10 years before, and now masking is an international phenomenon, especially with the corona you know, entering our lives. So now we are more, more worried about corona coming to the surgeon than an infection going to the patient. So we were uh, you know, just uh, pushed to use all sorts of things. And uh, the, uh, this coverall with N95 mask, and a visor was what was suggested to us and to use if we have to operate in these corona times. And uh, then uh, we pushed ourselves to use, you know, these respirators. Uh, and we found out that the respirator has got a valve which, which can be unsterile. So we innovated and we put a, a mask to that respirator as well. So it is uh, very difficult to use a coverall and operate for two, three hours, especially when you're doing revisions. And so we wanted some innovation. See, the innovation we, we, we did was we asked our uh, supplier to prepare a, a head and neck covering like this, and uh, then a, a leg and foot covering like this. And then we wore a, a regular gown. And then if you are using an identify, it is OK. If you are using a respirator, it is OK. So now this is our attire uh, about mask and uh, capping. So if you are in a laminar flow theater, it is best to use a cap. Anyway, now there is no question, so you have to use something like this. Okay, theater gown, we spoke about it. So and the most of the bugs are not coming from the air or from anywhere. It is coming from the OT staff. Every person inside the operation theater sheds 500 to 55,000 particles per minute. And the bugs are coming from there. That's why it is very important that your gowns are covered and they should have an elastic kind of a thing at the end of uh, you know, the legs and at the end of your hands. And then you wear gloves over that. So otherwise you are spreading the gram-positive bacteria. You are just throwing gram-positive bacteria into the OT. So 
the jewelry yeah category 3 evidence now very strong so it, for the patient if it is not coming in the way of your surgery you don't have to remove it and the taping so which is the ritual we do it is not for any other infection reason it's just to prevent the jewel getting lost and surgeons certainly are the uh, staff scrubbing staff certainly should not use rings in their hand because it increases the chance of glove uh, perforations avoid all jewelry uh, uh, all the sc uh, scrub team and theater footwear there is no strong evidence but still uh, you know advisable to uh, use a special footwear which is used only in the theater so dress there is category 3 evidence but it's good practice to change into outer clothes whenever you are leaving the theater and use a new set of clothes every time you enter now this is a, a video i loved this video it shows one of the most important things we all should understand the ot staff movement in the theater if you are in a laminar flow theater it disturbs the whole flow one person walking disturbs the whole laminarity and you can see how it is uh, i know spread all across and you imagine two three people walking and your laminar flow theater uh, you know laminar laminarity in the uh, you know theater is not being maintained so the most important thing from this my presentation i want all the uh, viewers audience to remember is you must reduce the traffic in the operation theater if you are doing a joint replacement surgery do not allow people we lock the theater once everybody is in anesthetist is not going out for a coffee no one goes out everything must be inside the theater before you start and then open the door only after you close and this is the paper i was talking about i encourage each and every person whether you are an experienced surgeon if you have not read this or you are a you know beginner please read this consensus on periprosthetic joint infection where uh, surgeons from across the globe and the societies from across the globe have been you know involved in producing this document and it details each and every point from you know uh, irrigation of the wound to antibiotics to every point has been you know addressed and a clear guideline is given and a consensus a recommendation has been made so so the most important thing to rem uh, remember is you are the lead you are the captain as a surgeon and you should be obsessed about attention to detail and you should educate everyone in the Uh, you know staff i i what i do is i call my all my theater staff and show them the excellent results of joint replacement surgery and also some of the complications because we don't take care of these uh, things in the operation theater once they see it uh, i know they will uh, i know get it right so i i had you know big problem in getting the uh, you know theater staff understand you know they always used to keep uh, Uh, been near the exhaust of uh, laminar flow theater and i i used to tell them look it has to go it should not keep it keep it aside but when i showed them the videos and showed them education uh, you know how it works the next time i did not have to explain to them what to do but they understood and kept everything in place success comes from a relentless focus on few fundamentals thank you very much Hello, Gani. Hi, right, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Uh, over to Dr. Chandra uh, C. S. Yadav for our next talk: How to deal with the uh, post-operative dislocation? Another unfortunate complication which we don't want to face, but yes, we have to at some stage. And how to address that? Over to him. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gani. Oh.
thank you dr gani uh dislocation in our literature it is a full of dislocation in total of arthroplasty uh, though it is uh, not very common in primaries less than 5% in revision it is much more uh factor surgeons what i feel whenever there is a failure whether it is total hip or total knee it is the surgeon who is responsible for the failure majority of the time more than 80% or 90% and the sometime poor, uh, poor implant selections sometime patient related factor but main factor is surgeon and combined uh, factors as well about the uh, basically i will make one comment my task has been made easy by previous speakers because they have covered most of the thing and i will not go into the detail of whether which approach but i always use posterior approach it doesn't affect the abductors uh, and it is easy exposure it is less blood loss and excellent ex exposure and this only one disadvantage which it is more dislocation in the cases of posterior approach but i do not agree with this statement at all and uh, if you go through the literature uh, previously if you do not do extended myocapsular repair dislocation rate is much high if you learn how to do myocapsular repair dislocation rate is almost zero and uh, significantly less we have done this study at aims it is comparative study before 2006 we were not repairing and after the 2006 when i started independent arthroplasty we i started repairing it so uh, we have published in geocity uh, that it is significantly low and even less than anti approach if you do it properly through the post approach when you do uh, any total hip arthroplasty your patient position has to be good absolutely true lateral and stable you should be very good at eye walling and careful intra operative visualization of whole acetabulum trans acetabular ligament lesser trochanter and osteophyte all these three have you have to see all these things to have good result to avoid dislocation and ensure anatomical placement of the component and carefully check and recheck motion impingement if any stability in all the direction do excellent repair and uh, judicious protocol post operatively so this has been discussed i will not go into the detail offset restore offset very important dr manoj and dr chanshekar has clearly mentioned combined antiversion it is most important statement if you are doing totally through the posterior approach never reduce your combined anti version unlike the anterior approach it should be around 40 or if it is more than uh, 45 degree no issue but it is less patient may have dislocation and do proper balancing especially at at aims i we used to get very difficult hip ankylosed hip because we have uh, uh, very uh, uh, rheumatology clinic over there so do proper balancing by soft tissue release uh, uh, like total knee arthroplasty if there is a dislocation then what to do find out the cause most important to go further and to treat it and uh, if you go into the cause component mal position may be there of mainly socket mal position inadequate soft tissue tension because of these reasons i will not go once again into detail it has been discussed impingement may be there abductor mechanism insufficiency because of four or five reason and patient compli patient compliance problem like dr chandrashekhar uh, patient uh, he is lucky he has not got the dislocation otherwise patient has to be compliance so how to approach the st stability what we have in our hand we have large diameter head extra large uh, diameter head elevated liner bi or tripolar and constrained cup even constrained tripolar is also available now so as i told you restore the offset when there is a well fixed implant cup is well fixed and you think version is less then take out the liner and use the elevated liner and it is more than enough for the dislocation and there is a if there is a basically 
head diameter it is also important and increase the head diameter do that and increase the head diameter if you increase the height head diameter jump distance increases and hip is more stable even if uh, the neck diameter is less the basically ratio improves so dislocation is less and in the sub hemi spherical cup dislocation and impingement is less so impingement may be intraprosthetic and between the neck and bone as well so decide what is the pain problem and treat accordingly so about the large head large head is definitely it increase the you can see it increase the jump height and stability if this is a study it is a 6% dislocation if you use 32 mm it uh, goes to 3% uh, dislocation so definitely it improve uh, the jump distance uh, but you see this from this photograph at the abduction angle is also very important now it is better to put uh, cup into the 40 degree uh, abduction than the 50 degree abduction because if abduction is more and if you increase the uh, head size it doesn't help much you can see over here here it is uh, 60 degree abduction even after increase the head side jump distance is not increasing if uh, abduction angle is uh, abduction angle angle ho jayega okay if you increase the head diameter significant uh, jump distance increases so that is very but large diameter has it has a own problem and one thing is more important how much large this is also very important relevant question beyond 36 or 32 uh, mm there is a no extra advantage and uh, it has uh, problems of large diameter head like you can see from here if you go from 36 mm it is laboratory data to 48 mm hardly any increase of jump distance so after 32 or 36 then you have to think about something else not the large diameter head then comes the role of dual mobility dual mobility significantly increase the jump distance in comparison to the large head and it has advantage of large head as well as well as it doesn't have disadvantage of large head like it doesn't causes much wear and tear of large head and so if you uh, see from this laboratory data 48 mm head bhr this is the jump distance uh, around 10 mm from the 46 mm uh, dual mobility md and you can see significant increase of jump distance so if you want to increase significant jump distance change thr into the dual mobility system and it can be done with the many company thing and uh, similar study it says go for the dual mobility do not try much more beyond the 36 Uh, millimeter about the constraint liner what i feel after the advantage of dual mobility the constraint liner role is almost limited and uh, it is very desperate situation you can go for the constraint liner otherwise i will not go detail uh, into the this situation and it has many drawbacks because uh, early failure loosening even intraprosthetic dislocation in constraint cup is not uncommon and so this is all about this is basically all of rhythm about the unstable total hip arthroplasty uh, go like that implant mal position if it is significant mal position change the implant if there is a not significant mal position go for either uh, dual mobility or increase the liner increase the head size if impingement look for that remove that whatever cause if abductor deficiency is there uh, repair it if it is possible or go for the dual mobility or lastly to the constraint liner so this is all about the dislocation and uh, instability so basically prevent it and if it is happening again and again then identify it most important if you can identify it then you can correct it for the stable hip forever so many things you have for the stability of hip in the cases of recurrent dislocation and thank you thank you gani thanks a lot sir wonderful presentation
and the last uh, talk of the today's uh, program is going to be by uh, professor rajesh gupta i think he just joined so over to dr okay. rajesh gupta are you there winning shots winning shots rajesh bahut handsome lag raha hai tu bollywood chala ja yaar hi 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 kya baat hai sir thank you koi bhi bata main na aap logo ko milne aaya hu basically seriously participate karna shuru kar do thank you sir thank you thank you okay i'm just starting yeah the screen karo na ratgani visible my slide yeah. visible yes yes yeah. very well very okay well. fine so good evening so uh, i'm the last batsman you know so i missed because, i think because because you have finished the opd <laughs> he has done the job <laughs> <laughs> this is routine for every webinar whenever you come you come late always because finishing the opd <laughs> no sir because today i made a point that i have to reach in time you know for my talk at least <laughs> <laughs> great so, fine so we will we will we'll go you know so uh, i am going to talk on you know dvt preventions uh, latest guidelines and recommendations uh, in uh, indian context you know let's see how it goes so uh, what is uh, venous thromboembolism it is a uh, basically a combination of deep vein thrombosis and uh, pulmonary embolism most of these uh, thrombi they uh, resolve spontaneously but around uh, 1 to 4% they develop into symptomatic vte now uh, after total uh, joint replacement you know the fatal pulmonary embolism can occur up to the tune of 0.3 to 1% Uh, in india the incidence of uh, dvt is around 3.7 to 17% in different series so we need a, a proactive approach to reduce the incidence of uh, venous thromboembolism now everybody knows what is you know virchow's tri and triad you know it is endothelial injury hypercoagulability and abnormal blood flow leading to thrombosis and uh, what are the consequences of uh, unprevented vte it is a symptomatic uh, dvt or pulmonary embolism fatal pulmonary embolism increased risk of recurrence and chronic post thrombotic syndrome now we all know that uh, any patient of dvt can present with a pain discoloration of the legs cough or leg tenderness swelling of the leg or lower limbs warm skin and prominent superficial veins so there are uh, some risk factors you know uh, associated with it there are strong risk factors moderate and weak risk factors now hip or knee replacement is a strong risk factor for dvt with a odd ratio of more than 10 now if you look at uh, you know caprini risk assessment model the elective orthoplasty has been given 5 points and if the points are more than 5 they are high risk for development of dvt now uh, the estimated dvt risk uh, in different series around 40 to 80% you know with the hip and knee orthoplasty and therefore we have to have you know a, th- a profile axis for that maybe low molecular uh, weight heparin and mechanical thromboprophylaxis axis now in the absence of pharmacological profile axis uh, the incidence of dvt is around 39% in total hip replacement it the incidence is very high without no profile axis now we all know these predisposing uh, risk factors i am not going into detail of it now this diagram is showing you know uh, between day 2 and day 8 there is a maximum chance of developing dvt and the maximum is around you know day 4 you know see here day 4 is the maximum one now profile axis can be by mechanical devices or pharmacological methods and the pharmacological options there are so many we are going to discuss them now there are uh, many uh, guidelines you know uh, by which uh, the people decide how to go about uh, in india i don't know about any national guidelines we are following you know uh, i think uh, most of the institutions are having their own guidelines or most of the surgeons are having their own guidelines but i am not sure you know we will be discussing it uh, with the eminent faculty here but uh, the nice guidelines uh, for elective thr you know they say 
10 days of uh, low molecular weight heparin and then switch over to 20 days uh, of aspirin you know this is known as a hybrid you know prophylaxis now uh, another guideline says low molecular weight heparin in combination with the uh, anti embolytic you know uh, stockings for 20 no this has the heparin here has to be continued for 28 days and there are then these novel agents you know uh, ribroxaban you know it has to be used for again more than 14 days now the ACCP guidelines recommend the use of low molecular weight heparin and low dose, uh, you know, unfractionated uh, heparin, then warfarin, you know, uh, fundaparinox, uh, aspirin, uh, and then, you know, IPCD for at least uh, 10 to 14 days and can extend up to 35 days. Now, the recommendation is to use minimum of 10 to 14 days of all these agents and an intermittent pneumatic compression dive device that is IPCD. And there is also a recommendation that irrespective of the concomitant use of an IPCD or length of treatment, use of low molecular weight heparin is in preference to the other below given, you know, agents. So low molecular weight heparin is the choice for most of the surgeons. Now, there are studies to show that early prophylaxis in surgical patients with low molecular weight heparin has been associated with significant reduction in post-operative venous thrombosis. Now, Hall et al. in uh, 2014 found that initiation of therapy within eight hours of surgery has the greatest effect. Now, again, ACCP recommend that low molecular weight heparin to be given to patients undergoing major orthopedic procedure at least 12 hours preoperatively or postoperatively. This is most of us are also following. Now, coming to each of the agents, you know, the low molecular heparin, you know, uh, enoxaparin, uh, it is commonly one used, and uh, dose is uh, for prevention is 40 milligrams subclinious OD. And uh, as I've already told you, it has to be start uh, at 12 hours or more preoperatively or postoperatively and can be extended up to 35 days. It is a preferred choice for most of the orthopedic surgeon, you know, and uh, then there are some clear renal clearance issues. We have to adjust the dose. It has a greater bioavailability, longer half-life, wider therapeutic dex, and less uh, risk of side effects as compared to unfractionated heparin. There are many studies to show that the lower molecular weight heparin uh, is superior to uh, unfractionated heparin uh, uh, and warfarin or aspirin. Now, unfractionated heparin uh, the dose for prophylaxis is 5,000 units subcutaneously every 8 to 12 hours. So we have to repeat it, you know, it, it, it should be given BD at least. And given two hours before surgery, and we have to resume the full dose after surgery. Here, uh, the advantage for this is uh, renal adjustment here is not required, you know, it is metabolized by the liver. But the side effect here is the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which is cumbersome, you know, there's a problem with it. We have to have... a uh, you know, uh, uh, the counts done, you know, uh, platelet count done very frequently. Now, coming to uh, factor 10A inhibitors, uh, uh, there are uh, indirect inhibitors like uh, fondaparinux, and uh, it is to be given 2.5 milligram uh, subcutaneously, and it has to be started six to eight hours after the surgery. Now, another one is uh, direct inhibitors. Uh, it is, you know, the drug is. Uh, uh, Rivaroxaban and 10 milligram OD, it is to be given six to eight hours after the surgery and can continue up to three to 35 days, you know. And there is another drug, uh, uh, Apixaban. Now, in patients undergoing major orthopedic surgery and who decline or are uncooperative with injections or an IPCD, then we can use all of these, you know, oral uh, formulations. Now, warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist, and uh, um, guidelines also say we can also use it in the you know prophylaxis of the THR. But here the problem is dose adjustment. Here we have to have you know INR done. It has to be between the range of two to three. Now, aspirin uh, nowadays people are you know jumping to aspirin now. Uh, it is considered it is inexpensive, easily administrative, and there is low risk of bleeding. And we give it in a low dose, you know, 81 milligram BD for at least four to six weeks. And it reduces the, you know, uh, chances to 36% in THR patients. Now, studies also show that when there is a contraindications to pharmacological prophylaxis, you know, aspirin uh, can be used in combination with the compression devices. 
Now, there are contraindications to uh, pharmacological uh, thromboprophylaxis. We know an oral anticoagulant with INR more than, you know, two thrombocytopenia, non bleeding disorders, evidence of active bleeding, uncontrolled hypertension, and lumbar puncture or epidural spinal anesthesia expected within 12 hours or performed within last four hours. And stroke, new stroke, there are contraindications. Now, as we know, after surgery, you know, we uh, know all of us do this, you know, early mobilization of patient is very, very important, you know, immediately, you know, when the patient comes out of uh, surgery, we advise the patient few exercises on the bed, ask him the, you know, uh, to sit on the side of the bed and we can make him up as early as possible. This is very, very important to prevent DVT. Now we can use compressive stockings, uh, you know, intermittent and pneumatic compression devices and uh, venous foot pumps for the prevention. Now, uh, there is a comparative effectiveness of mechanical prophylaxis versus no thromboprophylaxis and mechanical prophylaxis significantly decreases DVT, you know, uh, and there are studies for that and the risk of proximal DVT was not significantly different. Now, again, ACCP guidelines say that use of mechanical method in addition to pharmacological prophylaxis during hospitalization in patient with high risk. So it has a role especially during hospitalization. Now, again, a very important point here is the evidence condemns the use of uh, IVC filter placement for primary prevention. You know, it is to be avoided in prophylaxis. Now, coming to, you know, in Indian patients, there are uh, you know, some old studies which say that in India, the, the in Indian patient, the incidence is very low. So there is no need for, you know, thrombo, thrombo uh, prophylaxis. This is again another study, you know, we showing it is not justified, you know, but now things are changing. Most of people are doing a total hip replacement and there are complications are coming up. Now there is another, these, these are the new studies. Now they say VT is not uncommon in Indian patients and we should use, you know, chemoprophylaxis. So in conclusion, the patients undergoing THR are, are at high risk. VTE prophylaxis, mechanical and or pharmacological should be administered. VTE prophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin seems to be more efficient overall compared with other available methods of VTE prophylaxis. There's a, you know, skepticism about, remains about the use of aspirin as a sole method for the VTE prophylaxis in THR. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Uh, Professor Rajesh Gupta. Over to Dr. Rohit Rambani to carry on further proceeding regarding discussion, question, answer, and if any interesting case panel discussion, we are already overrunning the time. So we have to wind up also at some stage. So yeah, yeah over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, all the presenters. Any questions in the last uh, last few presentations? What is the consensus about the laminar airflow theater? Yeah. Whether it is required must or it is not must. So let's ask Chandrasekhar about the yeah, yeah, yeah. evidence on that because having worked in uh, various countries, uh, uh, US and Canada, I'm yeah. not sure a lot of US theatres are laminar flow theatres. Yeah, I think if you go by the evidence, they they you know there is no strong evidence to say that you need laminar flow air theatres for orthoplasty surgeries. <clears throat> uh, but I am. You know, biased towards having doing these, <laughs> you know, these kind of surgeries in laminar flow theaters only. But evidence, there is no strong evidence. At time, there is a contrary evidence. Rather, laminar flow may increase the infection. I may be wrong, but yeah, other yeah. speakers, I think, can come in that. Particularly in the corona time. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Let's that's a different about... discussion. We can <laughs> so I mean, if we start corona discussion, there is no end to it. No, we're not going to discuss corona situation. We're going to discuss a normal situation pre-corona or hopefully post-corona. Yeah. yeah. Let's Professor Rajesh Gupta has a point. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Um, first to Dr. Chandrasekhar, you know, uh, we have Indian dying here, you know. Uh, yes, I sir. just want to know, you know, any guidelines for, you know, DVT prevention, uh, you know, Dr. Chandrasekhar? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's which Chandrasekhar? Am I? Can I answer that? No, 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 no. First, first CS and then you. <laughs> yes. yes. First, first other. Uh, okay, Dr. Rajesh. Yes. You know, I was the first person in the country who started opposing the routine use of heparin.
from 2005-6 when I started independent arthroplasty. In my unit, it was being used. I have seen problem with the heparin use. Same time, I visited center of Ross Crawford in Australia. He was not using. And since then, I am not using at all. I use venous pump and I believe in aspirin combination of venous pump and aspirin. And I use heparin whenever it is required for the medical point of view. Suppose patient is having some stunt or some stroke patient is there. He is on already heparin. Then I use it. Otherwise, I believe in physical measures that venous and calf pump and aspirin. No, sir. No, my question is not this. My question is, are there any guidelines in India or not? No, in India, there is a no guideline. So that, that, that was why, no, I have gone through the literature in these days, you know, the, Dr. Gani has given this lecture to a person who has never used the parent. Most of the studies are done. <laughs> most of, most of, most and, of, most and of the Gani studies have done. Two qualification, two complications. Because both of us are, both of, have. Because both of us are your students, you know, that's the point, <laughs> problem. <laughs> so, so and there is no guidelines, you know. Yeah, no okay. guidelines. Coming guidelines. To, Coming to UK, you know, now yeah. what they are prioritizing the there? Guidelines which we follow. Yeah. And we are in our trust, we are using a Pixaban regularly, which starts within six hours after the surgery and carries on. Uh, we don't use drains, as uh, Dr. Yadav has uh, rightly said. Uh, we don't use low molecular weight heparin, not used it for four or five years now. But we use a Pixaban. We did find that there is an issue with the patients using uh, Pixaban. Chandrasekhar has just put a Nice slide in there. So, Chandrasekhar, you want to uh, pitch in? I think there is a role. We cannot just say that the DVT doesn't happen in my patients. It happens in the patients. So, DVT, uh, so I, I think uh, we, can't, we can't have a dogmatic statement that DVT happens only in the West and DVT does not happen in the East or something like that. But uh, there is a complete 180 degree turn in the world over about using these DVT prophylaxis. So the ACCP guidelines, which we all followed for decades together, has yes. been questioned and you know, challenged in the recent times. And even uh, you know, back in 2016, you know, from 2016 onwards or you know, 2015 onwards, the use of chemical prophylaxis has come down drastically. So if you look at this AHKS poll, I know in 2016, this is uh, Dan Barry's slide, I know, from Mayo Clinic. See, uh, this was a, I know, question to all the AHKS uh, participants, which are surgeons across, uh, I know, US. So most of them have stopped using routine use of uh, chemical prophylaxis and especially injectables. So more than 80% of them are using only aspirin. I think now world over, it is a standard practice for a standard hip replacement or a knee replacement. So the techniques we are following, early mobilization, mechanical things, and the anesthetics, everything put together, there is very, very, yeah, very, very, uh, you know, less practice, indication. Less DVD in newer practice. Yeah. So, so there is less, uh, this is across the globe. I'm not just talking about uh, India as well. Uh, India only. So in our practice, we have stopped you routine use. I'm talking if there is somebody who has already had DVT, who has had uh, some heart problems and he's on heparin, that is a different question. Yeah, a routine yeah. hip or knee replacement practice, there is no I know, need for using chemical prophylaxis, just aspirin and the mechanical whatever we are doing is enough. Probably the problem is there are too much studies or too much li literature created by pharma funded studies. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Pharma funded. Yeah. So it's a, it's a bias. Most. It's a great bias. So it's yeah. a very difficult, it, it is creating confusion throughout. Yes. Doctor, it is not, a, if, if I may interject here, sir. It is uh, a creating uh, a fear or uh, it looks like that uh, it needs a very balanced study. Dr. Chandra, can you stop sharing your screen so that we can have it? Yeah, thank you. So I, I think the, the important point, uh, Dr. Tucker, which is rightly raised, is the pharma-funded studies. What we need to uh, learn, everybody, 
uh, needs to learn uh, is how to interpret these studies. And I think yeah. uh, that's, a, that's a webinar you need to do how to read the literature because everybody posts <laughs> the literature left, right, and center, I, 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 yeah. but yes. doesn't know the interpretation of how these, uh, these should be reported. Because their intentions are different, eh? that's why. No, but that's a very valid comment that uh, we need to know how to read literature correctly and then how to apply that correct literature in our practice. I, that I, I, Gani, yeah. I always say more than 80% literature irrelevant. These are my <laughs> four chiefs, honestly speaking. I believe yeah. in history data. My uh, four chief like either it is controversial or it changes with the time or compromise third c compromise written under the influence of companies fourth copied so these are my four c about the literature much ghost writing is going on <laughs> but the, when the junior trainees and the uh, registrars and uh, young surgeons want problem with audio rohit rohit Ah, audio is not coming. Yeah, audio is not coming. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now, yeah now, now we can. Probably hey. when He's Professor Yadav has written something. Again, you are lost. Your audio is lost. Just because of audio. The audio issue. Yeah. <clears throat> so the key bit is that we need we need people to understand that the randomized control trial, the outcome measure out of the 100 people, only it is relevant to three people. And that's what people don't understand. And they apply to 100 people and say, we didn't get that result. And that's the problem. And I think this is more and more important with at least I, my trainees, I try to uh, tell them that this is this is how you, they need to look into the literature and interpret it correctly. Because people just read it because it's published in JBJS American or in core or in Lancet. And we've recently seen what Lancet has done. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, uh, they're not interpreting it properly. Yeah, exactly. Any extras to discuss yes. or shall we call it a day? So devil, devil is in the detail and the beauty is also in the detail. So you have to go in details. <laughs> that is the That's issue. True. And but uh, we, we, do not, we do not have a time to go into details. That is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. If somebody, somebody gives ready-made, then and then everybody is ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So do you want extra discussion or you want to close? Gani? I think it is a quarter to nine and people are hungry apparently. And that also, also ortho, ortho, TV, ortho TV must have to give this uh, to other Not people also. And, and the lunch and dinner is dinner. ready. So, <laughs> snacks are about to be served. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are they home delivered? They will be. Nahi to abhi fir se andar se awaj aaye. Kab ka khana tayyar hai. Boom laga rahe hai. Tere ko to jirur bol lenge jitni tu kar raha hai na. That is exactly the time. <laughs> I think if, with permission of Dr. Rohit Rambani, can we wind up? Yeah, I think we should wind up. I think it was a brilliant uh, effort. Uh, I should congratulate uh, Dr. Gani and his team. And uh, everybody presented really well. And yes. thank you, Neeraj. Neeraj has come helping us through. Yeah, I was here only. He I just put on my video. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Neeraj. Neeraj. Uh, so, thank time, you very much. Thanks to, first of all, I would like to start with a big thanks to the audience. And what I've been told is we have touched 1,000 audience. So, that is a big great, number. Great, 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 great. Excellent. So, that is Neeraj, a great. Neeraj, was it going to Facebook also? No, no. Only YouTube and Ortho TV. Okay, ortho okay. TV and YouTube. So that is a good number and thank you very much audience for listening and bearing with us. Special, uh, of course, thanks to the guest faculty speakers for wonderful talks and I wanted the type of the talks and exactly that's what has happened. Special thanks to Dr. C.S. Yadav and Dr. Manoj Vadwa for pitching in a last minute to replace Dr. Avtar who unfortunately at very last minute because of unavoidable circumstances could not attend this meet. He did want to do. And my thanks to my co-moderator, Dr. Rambani and Dr. Sanjeev for moderating the sessions. 
of course i am grateful to sun pharma for support logistics extending all the logistic help and last but not the least wonderful effort by dr neeraj bajrani and his team and team arthur tv thank you very much good night thank you thank all you, the thank you, thank you. Thank you. congratulations thank you. and thank you very much getting